College senior Mindy Morgenstern was taking one last class at her university before graduating and following her dreams of working in athletics. She just moved into a new apartment off campus. She was dating a new guy and was looking forward to a modeling shoot the day her friends discovered the most terrifying and unexpected scene behind the door of apartment number nine. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. I know I say this in a lot of my videos, but this is a crazy case. It's an unbelievable story. It's one that sticks with you and scares you. So I can only imagine what it felt like for the people involved. Before I get into the story, I want to thank our sponsor for today. I want to thank our sponsor for today, and that is Dipsy. Spring is a time of growth and transformation, and Dipsy is here to help you explore the sensual side of the season of renewal. With Dipsy's sexy audio stories, you can indulge in your blooming desires, newfound passions, and the thrill of taking risks. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. If you love romance novels, you will love Dipsy because the stories really come alive. Discover stories about second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot and heavy hookups. Dipsy is radically inclusive. There's something for everyone. They have stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of their stories are voice acted by people of color. You've never heard celebrities like this before. You can listen to stories voiced by Sharonis J. Jack. Jackson, ER Fightmaster, and Luke Cook. New content is released every week, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has very soothing sleep stories, which I love. I fall right to sleep listening to people talk, and a lot of you have told me that my videos do the same for you. During the storm, the heavy rain had knocked the soft pink blossoms off their branches as the wind continuously swept the petals and swirls across the street. Now that the rain has stopped, the city glimmers all around me. Dipsy has wellness sessions and sexy stories that you can read as well. So let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner. For my viewers, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Kimberlea. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipseastories.com slash Kimberlea. I will leave it below and on the screen. Again, that's dipsystories.com slash Kimberlea. Thank you so very much to Dipsy for making this video possible. Now let's get into the story for today. I also want to thank all of you so very much for all the condolences and the kind words. It's been a rough couple weeks. We lost another pet in our family, my bearded dragon, Dragon. Yes, it's just a lizard, but it's not. Like a lot of you said, it was a family pet. He was with us a very, very long time, and it was just so sudden, and I can't even clean out his enclosure at this point. I'm going to have to have John do it because it's sad. It's sad. And... I just appreciate you all so very much. A day before that, I was excited because I was getting to know all of you so well. I did a community post where I also posted about my bearded dragon, and I want to shout out Crooked Halo. I told you I was going to wear a shirt with raccoons. Uh, you have a pet raccoon? I have two shirts with raccoons on them. I think they're so adorable, but they actually can be very mean. Very, very mean. But here we go. Live fast, eat trash. So thank you all for telling me about you because I know I try to keep these videos about my victims, but I am human and AI has taken over. So I feel like putting a little bit of my humanity in these videos is important because someday I feel like YouTube is going to be just overrun with computer generated creators, which, hey, I mean, the future could be really cool. But sometimes I want to inject just a little bit of my personality and let you know who I am. And I want to get to know all of you. So if you go to that post on my community tab, I'm still going through all the comments. And I just wanted to thank you for engaging on that post and also engaging with each other and getting to know each other. Okay, sorry for that long intro. Let's get into the story for today. Today, I want to introduce you to the Morgenstern family. It started with Larry Morgenstern, 
who married Eunice Bauer. After their wedding, the newlyweds began taking over Larry's family farm in the exact farmhouse where his mother was born out in rural New Salem, North Dakota. They were lifelong residents. And I think this is my very first time doing a case from North Dakota. And as I said, New Salem to be exact, not to be confused with Salem, Massachusetts. This is North Dakota. And New Salem is a quiet, friendly city with a strong sense of community. And the economy of New Salem is based on agriculture, manufacturing, and tourism, thanks to the proximity of the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Never been there yet. But it's just like any other little tiny town in the middle of nowhere, a farming community. We've done a couple cases that have farming communities in them. And the Morgan Stearns raised cattle, chickens, and they took in every stray dog that crossed their path. They loved animals, and they took pride in their farmland. But after some time enjoying the married life, the couple decided they wanted to start a family. Larry was 25, and Eunice was only 22 at the time. And by November of 1975, they were welcoming their first child into the world, and they named her Rebecca Morgan Stern. They loved Rebecca so very much. But not too long after she was born, the couple felt as though there was something missing from their life. They knew they wanted another child. And in their heart, they felt like they should adopt a child and give them the love that they deserve. This time, they adopted a little boy named Michael, who was very close in age to their biological daughter, Rebecca, at the time. I think he was about a year older than her. So he fit right in to the Morgan Stern household. And Michael was treated no differently than Rebecca. Biological or not, these were Larry and Eunice's children. Their world revolved around making sure that they knew they were loved and giving them everything they needed to thrive. However, once Rebecca and Michael were no longer babies, Larry and Eunice missed having little ones around. Rebecca was about 10 years old at the time, and the Morgensterns felt as though they still had so much love to give to a child in need. So again, they turned to adoption. They had had such an amazing experience the first time around. They were so excited to bring another child into their life. And actually, they wanted two more children. So they could not wait to welcome them into their home and shower them with love and affection. They were notified of a little girl that was coming up for adoption. Her name was April, and she was living out in Colombia. So they flew out to meet this beautiful toddler, and they knew right away they wanted to bring her home to the United States. She was perfect, and she fit right in, and they felt like their family really was complete. But again, they had it on their heart to open up their home to another child if another child in need matched with the couple. And it wasn't long before the adoption agency reached out to inform them that little April had a biological sister that was up for adoption, and she was just an infant when Eunice met her in Colombia for the very first time. It was love at first sight, really. Her name was Mindy. She was born April 29th, 1984. Both Eunice and Larry were captivated by Mindy's beautiful, big, dark brown eyes. This picture right here of her as a baby, this got to me. I was in tears, looking at that cute little face and knowing what I already know was going to happen to this family in the future. I couldn't hold it in. Eunice noticed Mindy's eyes first. They were the biggest, darkest, most beautiful eyes that she'd ever seen. And once she held her in her arms, she knew she never wanted to let her go. When they brought Mindy home from Columbia, the Morgan Stearns were officially a family of six, and they were loving every minute of it. You can tell how loved Mindy was from her childhood photos, how happy she was with her family. Just look at that big smile. She loved her daddy. And Larry said that even as a baby, Mindy was quite a character. He remembered when they brought her home, it changed their lives forever. She was loud and happy and fun. She would be laughing all the time, running around like crazy, and she loved being outdoors where she could get all of that energy out. While growing up in rural North Dakota, April and Mindy stood out from their peers. They had that glowing caramel skin and it set them apart from all the other kids in their class. So there's a good and the bad to this. Standing out could be great, but at that age, children began teasing April and Mindy and giving them a hard time for the way they looked, for their differences. But their big sister, Rebecca, she dealt with it right away. Rebecca told the youngsters to back off. Those were her little sisters, and Rebecca fiercely protected April and Mindy. She wanted her classmates to understand they were just like everyone else. And she was determined to ensure that her sisters were not treated any differently because of the way that they looked. But soon, even the meanest kids began to have a soft spot for little Mindy. Her bright, bubbly personality, her contagious enthusiasm, sense of humor, 
and her willingness to help others won them over time and time again. Working on the farm was a favorite pastime of Mindy's growing up. The Morgensterns taught their children to care for their land and instilled a strong work ethic in them. Mindy's favorite activities included helping with harvest, tending to the gardens, and caring for the animals. These experiences gave her great appreciation for the environment and how to value working hard. So from a young age, Larry actually taught Mindy how to drive a tractor, and soon she was out there in the field lifting bales of hay and helping with all the chores. And he took great pride in watching his daughter progress. He was so proud when Mindy was old enough and capable enough to tend to the farm on her own. Aside from milking cows, raising chickens, she would adopt stray cats and dogs and take care of them. She absolutely loved animals. And she was very active growing up. She loved to play sports. She was on the basketball team. She ran track. And she was a cheerleader when she was in high school. She was known for her competitive spirit and ability to rally her teammates to victory. And in addition to being a very skilled athlete, Mindy played clarinet in the marching band. She was into everything. And no matter how grown up she was, Mindy remained the baby of the family. And she was the center of attention. Rebecca, being about 10 years older than Mindy, she had been dating a guy named Jason, and the pair got married when Mindy was only 12 years old. And they would all gather around for family dinners, which were a big deal in this household. And Jason was always amused by the fact that Mindy was the one sitting at the head of the table. It wasn't her parents, it was her. She would keep the conversation going, and she would make everyone laugh, because making people happy was Mindy's gift. She had a knack for bringing joy to everyone around her. And when she was around, everything was more fun. When she was growing up, Mindy's mom referred to her as a tomboy because she was tough and athletic, which came from working on the farm. But as she got older, Eunice saw her change so much. Eunice said that she just got so beautiful in her mother's eyes and she turned heads everywhere she went. It wasn't just her mama that thought she was beautiful. When she became a teenager, she actually started dabbling in modeling on the weekends. She wasn't quite aware of her beautiful looks though. And that's what was very impressive about her. Mindy's personality matched her stunning looks. Her inner beauty only highlighted what was on the outside. But no matter how beautiful or busy Mindy became, there was one thing in her life that was always her top priority, her faith. She grew up attending Zion Lutheran Church and Mindy lived her life based on the teachings of Jesus Christ and put God first in all of her decisions. She was motivated to be a good example to others. Her faith was her source of strength during difficult times, and she was surrounded by God's message, especially because Rebecca's husband, Jason, became a pastor, and soon they had kids of their own, and Mindy loved to babysit and play with her nieces and nephews. She was so close to her family, so it was a hard decision for her on where she should go to college. She knew that she wanted to become either a basketball coach or a physical therapist, and she was also interested in doing missionary work. Basketball, though, was her passion. Her inspiration was Michael Jordan. She loved the way he played, she loved his attitude, and she thought he was pretty good looking. Mindy and April would play basketball in the front of their farmhouse all the time, sometimes into late into the night, even after midnight. Mindy would always try to imitate Michael Jordan's moves. So with all that being said, all of her passions, everything she wanted to do, she was looking for somewhere close by, but that also had all the things she was looking for in a college. The closest college that was in the top three in the state and had a physical education major was almost 200 miles away in Valley City. It was Valley City State University, but Mindy felt that this is where she needed to be. She was accepted and she enrolled right after graduating from New Salem High School in 2002. Mindy was truly looking forward to all the new experiences and the opportunity to develop her identity away from all the familiar places and the people that she had known her whole life. However, she was also nervous about leaving her family and her friends and adjusting to an entirely new environment. Valley City is a small college town in North Dakota. There's only about 6,000 residents, 2,000 of which attend the college at the heart of the city and they come there for that purpose alone. It's known to be a safe place to live. The community is well known for being very friendly and welcoming. By that fall, Mindy was 18 and getting ready for life on campus. She took her old green baby blanket with her because she felt safe with it, and it reminded her of home. On the day her mom dropped her off at the dorms, she was struggling. Mindy didn't wanna stay. She wanted to go home. And Eunice understood that this was a big change for Mindy. She was leaving home for the very first time. 
It felt scary and overwhelming, but Eunice did her best to reassure Mindy it would be okay. After her mom left her at the dorms, she saw Mindy chasing after her car, flagging her down. So Eunice pulled over and she's like, what's wrong? And Mindy told her mom, she just cannot do this. Eunice said, relax, take a deep breath, inhale, exhale. And Mindy finally calmed down and she said, all right, mama. And she returned to her room. Hearing that breaks my heart because as a parent, I don't ever want to let my daughter go. But at the same time, we know that they have to become independent and they have to have these experiences in life. And this was a great learning experience. Besides, Mindy had a piece of home at Valley City. Her childhood best friend, Ashley Wallace, had decided to go to the same college. They were going there together. And I could tell they were best friends by the way they both did their eyeshadow. It's one of the first things I actually noticed about Mindy. As I was looking through all of the pictures of her from college, I noticed that she wore a shiny white shadow as a base with a high, dark sort of cut crease in the middle. It was very unique. I couldn't help but notice it and I wondered what it would look like on my eyes. Definitely not a makeup artist, but I did really want to try it. I think it probably made her stand out even more back then. It was very bold. A signature look for her, something that I don't think you could miss or forget. And it obviously inspired her friends to do the same. Ashley joining her at Valley City State University made Mindy's transition a little easier. Ashley being there was a reminder of home. It provided Mindy with comfort and familiarity in this new environment. Ashley was definitely essential in helping Mindy adjust to college life. She gave her that emotional support as she navigated this new world, but it didn't take long for Mindy to become very popular on campus and beyond. She was a big fish in this small pond she called home now. Within the first week of school, her friend said she already knew everyone on campus. That was her gift. But she did have a couple very good friends that she spent more time with than others. And that was her two new best friends, Tony Bauman and Daniel Hallstrom. Another thing I say in a lot of these cases when I'm describing the person that I'm introducing you to, I'll tell you what her friends thought of her. And sometimes in memes and other things I saw online and elsewhere, even reading the comment section sometimes, I notice people think these things can sound cliche. We've heard them all before. She had a strikingly beautiful smile that just lit up a room. Another viewer is definitely clicking off, and I get that. The same lines are reused again and again. Like, she's a loyal friend. She had a contagious smile and laugh. It goes on and on. But the thing is, we're hearing from the people who loved them, the person who knew these people, who cared about them, the individuals that were the closest to them. We don't know them. We're just hearing about them for the very first time. And of course, there's a saying not to speak ill of the dead. So would we really bring up bad qualities about someone who had to suffer a horrifying murder? I think the answer is no. But in this case, I'm going to tell you what Mindy's friends thought of her. They thought the world of her. If you take a moment and think about your own life and one of your best friends, what would you say if you lost them? You can imagine why certain attributes and characteristics and phrases are used to describe someone gone too soon, that they cared about so much. And Mindy's friend said that she was a great listener. She was always there for her friends. She cared about them and what was going on in their lives. And she gave them the best advice whenever they needed her. They knew that they could always turn to Mindy when they needed a shoulder to cry on, an ear to listen, or just someone to genuinely have a good time with. Mindy was a girl's girl. She had a lot of really good girlfriends. One thing that drew people to Mindy was her non-judgmental personality. It was easy to open up to her because she was compassionate and understanding. Mindy was the one that you would call in the middle of the night, and she truly would jump out of bed and stop whatever she was doing, even stop sleeping, to help you out. Tony and Mindy worked together at Tony's family's restaurant, Roby's. And Mindy was a waitress, which suited her personality very well. Even though she had a good time with Tony and Danielle, she was more of a homebody compared to her friends. She was the more serious one, the more grounded one of the group. Every Sunday, she would get up for church. She would wake her friends up and ask them to go with her because she sang in the choir. She volunteered with kids. Every chance she got, she was at church or studying. Her faith was about to become even more important to her. During her freshman year, Mindy was interested in trying out for college sports, but she began having some unusual symptoms and she needed to get a routine physical. And during this time, 
she got some very shocking news. Life-changing news. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. That's a chronic disease of the central nervous system. It's also a very unpredictable disease that affects people differently. Symptoms of MS include numbness, tingling, extreme fatigue, and difficulty with coordination and balance. That's really sad, especially for someone like Mindy that's so active. In its most severe form, MS can even cause paralysis and loss of vision. And there's currently no cure for it. But treatments are available to help reduce some of the symptoms and slow the progression of the disease. And like I said, for someone like Mindy, who had dreams of working in the sports industry, this was really devastating news. But Mindy found strength in her faith, and she was determined not to let her diagnosis define her. But it did change her life. One, it made her faith stronger, and two, it gave her a new purpose. She wanted to participate in clinical trials for new treatments to help people in the future. So she applied to become part of a trial to find a cure. Meanwhile, she was committed to inspiring others to live a healthy life and doing speeches around campus and at the local high school about the value of physical fitness. There was something else helping Mindy cope, her boyfriend, Kyle Kuznia. They met during homecoming weekend and Kyle was very popular at Valley City. He was actually crowned homecoming king. He was a junior at the time. Kyle was athletic, well-grounded in his faith and hardworking. Mindy really liked him and they clicked right away. The night they met, they just started chatting and hanging out. They had some pizza together and they talked for the next couple hours and the relationship just grew from there. Over the next couple years, Mindy's family got to know Kyle very well and they liked him a lot, especially because of how much Mindy loved him. She thought that he was perfect for her. Mindy told her mom she was going to marry Kyle one day. She really wanted a future with him. She already had her wedding dress kind of picked out what she wanted to wear. She was planning their wedding before he even proposed. She even had their wedding song picked out. But that never happened because Kyle broke her heart. They dated for two and a half years. But remember, Kyle was already a junior when they met. And after he graduated, it was harder for them to see one another. Mindy was busy. She had classes and Kyle was taking the next steps in his career. Then he ended up moving over an hour away. Long distance was too hard and Kyle broke it off. It was hard on Mindy because she believed that everything happened for a reason, and she tried her best to move on. But it wasn't long before she caught the eye of a local farmer boy, Jordan Raynham. The pair seemed to have a lot in common. It's always nice to have someone there when you're feeling down and alone and heartbroken. He had very similar upbringings on the farm and faith, and they actually met at church in October of 2004. He was clean cut, hardworking, soft-spoken, but he was definitely the opposite of Mindy when it came to being outgoing. But that helped ground her at times. He liked to take her to visit his family, and all of her friends knew that he was a really wonderful guy to Mindy. However, a few of them said that he was a lot more serious about Mindy than Mindy was about him, because she wasn't over Kyle. Not at all. She was hoping that somehow, some way, her and Kyle would find their way back to one another. But at this point, she was open to a new relationship with Jordan. So they started seeing more and more of one another until they became official. They were still together in the fall of 2005 when Mindy entered her final year of college. She had just a handful of classes left. But she was about to get some bittersweet news. She was a candidate for a new clinical trial of an experimental chemotherapy medication for MS. But in order to receive the infusions, she would need to limit her contact with as many people as possible, which is very hard to do with someone as social as Mindy was. But she knew that it was for the greater good. She hoped that by getting these experimental infusions of the medication, she can ultimately help future patients who were suffering with this condition. Doctors thought that living in the dorms on campus would expose Mindy to illnesses. So she decided to get her own apartment close to school and she found one that she really liked. It was only five minutes away at 515 8th Street, apartment nine. This is where she called home. Her friends were surprised that someone that was such a social butterfly like Mindy was gonna be able to live by herself. But they understood her reasons. She had to do this. She had to for her health. And Mindy felt really safe in this new apartment building. She had scoped out many different places to live, and this particular building actually had a few police officers and whatnot that were living in the building as well as around in the neighborhood surrounding her apartment. She would always see these officers around, and it made her feel safe. 
It was a great location. It was close to school, to work, to church, everything. And she took pride in decorating it with pictures of all the people she loved. She had picture frames on almost every wall of her one bedroom, one bathroom apartment. By the spring of 2006, Mindy was now 22 years old and was undergoing the medical infusions for the clinical trials. And she had one class left before graduating in December. So that brings us to the evening of September 13, 2006. Mindy's two best friends, Tony and Danielle, wanted to go out for some drinks that night. But there was a problem. Tony's boyfriend, James, he didn't really like Tony going out with certain friends like Danielle. There wasn't anything wrong with Danielle. It's just that Tony would get into a little too much trouble when the two hung out together. I think we've all had that one friend that we have just like a little too much fun with usually harmless, but could rub someone the wrong way. Mindy, on the other hand, she was level-headed, responsible, the good girl in the friend group. She didn't party a lot or partake in, you know, party favors, if you know what I mean, like some of the other college kids did. So if James thought that Tony was with Mindy, he wouldn't keep bothering her all night. So she lied. She said she was going over to Mindy's that night to hang out. But Tony's boyfriend, he had heard that line a few too many times. He really wasn't buying it. He was like, you know what? Let me talk to Mindy. Ugh. So now they know they're going to get caught in their lie if they don't quickly drive over to Mindy's real fast because they knew she would cover for them. So that's what they did. The reason why Tony knew Mindy would cover for her is because she really didn't like James. She thought Tony was too good for him. And she would give her honest advice that they should probably break up. He did not treat her right. So Tony and Danielle are trying to come up with this plan as they're driving to Mindy's apartment. They were thinking, okay, maybe we could get Mindy to agree to come out to the bar and just kind of hang out with us and be there whenever Tony's boyfriend would call back. And then Mindy could kind of chime in and say like, I'm right here. Or maybe it would just be enough for her to stay home, but jump on the phone real fast with James. So then Mindy could jump on and say like, yeah, I'm going to hang out with Tony and that would be that. So Tony kept calling Mindy to tell her the plan and to tell her they were on their way. But the thing is, the typically always there friend was not answering her phone. And that was strange because there was urgency. Danielle and Tony wanted to go have a fun night and it just seemed like everything was standing in their way. And now their alibi Mindy wasn't answering. So they're frustrated. Both girls are calling her back to back, but neither one could reach her. They were leaving messages. Tony got the voicemail and she said, hey, me and Danny are looking for you. We can't get a hold of you. But she didn't call back. Still nothing. They arrived at Mindy's a little before 9 p.m. And Tony spotted Mindy's car parked on the street. So they figured she must be home. They parked, Danielle stayed in the car, and Tony ran up to Mindy's apartment door. First, she had to go through the main door of the building then up the stairs to the second floor to apartment nine where Mindy lived. Tony knocked a few times, no answer. She even called Mindy's phone to see if she could hear it ringing inside, but she didn't hear anything. They were good friends. Tony knew that she was welcome anytime. So as she knocked again, this time she turned the doorknob and it was unlocked, which was very unusual. She made her way inside into the front hallway and she flipped on the light then she took about two or three steps inside and she saw something at her feet. Now in our minds, they try to make sense of everything we see. Our eyes take in stimuli, images, people, and our mind translates what we're seeing. When something doesn't add up, it may take a second for someone to realize what it is they're looking at. It would be unusual to see your friend lying on the ground. So at first, Tony wasn't sure what she was looking at. There was something on the floor, but then she realizes, it's Mindy. What is she doing there? So many thoughts were going through her mind. She was trying to make sense of this. Was she sleeping? Was she playing a prank? Did she fall because of her disease, because of MS? Mindy was just lying there, face up across the hallway diagonally. But when Tony looked at Mindy's eyes, that's when her brain registered that this is something way worse. She saw something around her neck. She knew that her friend was in trouble and she needed help. It just hit her and Tony ran out of Mindy's apartment screaming. She was just distraught. She was terrified. She was being really loud. And of course, with all this yelling, she was getting the attention of other people in the building. She ran all the way out to the car, just screaming, telling Danielle, we have to get help. There's something around her neck. 
So with all this commotion, other people in the building started to wonder what was going on, and a guy appeared in the hallway. He stuck his head out of one of the apartments, trying to figure out what in the world was happening. And by that time, Danielle had made her way up to Mindy's. She met the guy outside Mindy's door and said, please, can you go check on our friend? We think something happened to her. So they enter. Danielle went first. She did exactly what Tony had. She wanted to see for herself, and she did. She took a few steps in, and that's all she needed. She saw what Tony saw, and it was obvious to her just how bad the situation was. As soon as she realized what she was looking at, she ran back out of that apartment as fast as she could. She ran so fast, she hit the wall in the hallway. The guy that was standing there went inside to check to see if Mindy was still alive. He bent down, and he tried to see if he could feel a pulse. He looked out into the hall and he said, I'm sorry, your friend is gone. The thing is, checking Mindy's pulse really wasn't necessary. Any ordinary person, even without any medical experience, would have been able to tell that Mindy was no longer alive by the extent of her injuries. But surprisingly, sometimes people who stumble upon a deceased person, even someone that has sustained very serious injuries, they may not even notice the blood at first or just how bad the wounds are. I know this sounds unreal. How... Could Tony not have seen what was so obvious? But it's true. Our minds are so powerful, so much so, that there was a case that I recently became aware of when the Idaho murders happened. This is a short caveat, but it's relevant and it's interesting. A woman came out recently to defend the surviving roommates that supposedly either didn't hear the Idaho killings being carried out, Specifically, Dylan Mortensen. I think that's her name. It was a roommate that saw the shadowy figure in the house, but didn't call the police. Well, there was a similar case that happened three decades ago out in Buffalo, New York. Alana Zabel was living in a three-story home with her sorority sisters at the University of Buffalo. One night in September, they were very excited. They were starting the new year out. They went to a party that night at a fraternity nearby. And one of the girls from their group went home early before the others. So when Alana came back, she was a little later, and she couldn't get into the house because the door was locked. So she just decides to climb through a window. She lives there, no big deal. She did kind of notice there was a weird smell in the house. She had been drinking, and it was late, and she just wanted to get to bed. She did think she heard some heavy breathing coming from her roommate's bedroom, but she just figured it was her boyfriend having sex with her. So she ignored it. There was not one inclination for her to believe that her roommate was being murdered. Not only that, the next morning, she discovers her roommate lying lifeless in her room. And the thing is, she didn't see any blood. In her own words, she said, quote, I just saw liquid. My friend was taking her pulse. And I thought that my roommate choked on her own vomit. Right away, I said, oh, it's vomit. But then when the paramedics arrived, they stepped into the room and I heard the word blood And in a millisecond, when I looked in the room, the entire room was red, end quote. We have a defense mechanism that guards us from going into shock. It's to protect us so that we can run or fight to survive. If we see too much, we go in shock and we faint or freeze. So our minds create their own false reality. Helena defended Dylan in the Idaho case because we don't always recognize the signs. I don't know, has anything like that ever happened to you? Maybe not as extreme, but are mind blocking something out? Let me know. But back to Mindy and what was happening that September night in her apartment. The night her friends' lives and her life was changed forever. It's a moment that's etched into their minds, a traumatic moment that would never die along with Mindy. What happened to her? Who would want to hurt Mindy? The girls frantically call 911. They're hardly able to relay what is going on. So dispatch sends out Valley City Police Sergeant Dave Swenson to 515 8th Street, apartment 9. They called him because he only lived a block away. So they figured he could run over, see what was going on, make sense of it, and then report back with details. Tony and Danielle were outside when he arrived. They were shocked, and that's an understatement. They were hysterical. However, they were able to point Sergeant Swenson to Mindy's apartment. He'd actually been out to this particular apartment building before. He goes on calls all the time. This is a small town. He goes for noise disturbances, loud parties, music, bothering neighbors, and also just spending time in the neighborhood. He recognized Mindy. He'd seen her before on other occasions, but not like this. She volunteered around town, and he was familiar with her. But what he saw that night was literally 
what horror movies are made of. The smell was what he noticed first. Pine Sol, a cleaning solution, it has a very distinctive smell that's very bold and long-lasting, and as the name suggests, it smells like pine, but sort of mixed with ammonia or disinfectant. It's kind of like a freshly mopped floor smell. As Swenson made his way down the entry hallway into the apartment, there was a mat on the left with several pairs of shoes on it. And just past that, he saw Mindy lying across the floor. He saw her legs first and part of her midriff. She was fully clothed, wearing dark pants and a long-sleeved white top that had slid up, exposing her stomach. As he got closer, he saw she was lying on her back face up with her arms to her sides and her head was in a very unnatural position. He could tell something was wrapped around her neck. Getting even closer, he realized it was a belt around her neck and there was blood on it and on her face and it was pooling underneath her head. On the right, there were two knives, both bloody, and one was still in her throat with the handle broken and the other was lying right next to her head. This was bad. By this time, another officer was on scene, Valley City PD officer Andrew Sather. Dispatch had sent him out there for a call regarding a strangling, probably because Tony had said, I saw something around Mindy's neck. The officer met Sergeant Swenson inside. He saw Mindy's body. He checked for a pulse and, of course, made a record that she was deceased. He, too, made a comment about the smell of pine salt, and he noticed an empty bottle. It was kind of tucked between Mindy's right arm and the side of her body, kind of like in her armpit, with a cap nearby. When they removed the bottle, her keys were lying underneath, and there was an inside-out coral and white striped shirt on top of her right arm, and her open wallet was right next to it. Her unzipped purse was still connected to her right arm, both straps wrapped securely around her forearm. It didn't look like anything was taken from her wallet. All of her cards were still snug inside the slots, with her cell phone nearby as well. That coral shirt seemed out of place, and she was fully dressed. So they scanned the room, and the officers started noticing that there was clothing scattered around the apartment. Otherwise, it was very tidy. And as they followed this trail of clothing, they found a laundry basket right inside the door to Mindy's bedroom along with another pile of clothing. Her flip-flops were off her feet, lying close by on top of a few more items of clothing. A preliminary observation of what had happened seemed to lead the officers to think. Someone ambushed Mindy as she was bringing her laundry basket full of clothing upstairs from the communal laundry room on site in the building of her apartment. The motive? They weren't sure. But it could have been sexual in nature because it appeared from where the laundry basket landed that the person who did this was trying to get her into her bedroom, which is why there was clothing scattered from the hall to that room. But it looks like she put up a fight. And she might have been attacked when she was trying to escape out the front door. Everything seemed to have happened in a very small portion of this already small apartment between the front door, the small hallway, and her bedroom. The kitchen was located mere steps away from her head. It wouldn't have been difficult for someone to have grabbed those knives in an attempt to subdue her or make sure she was dead. But why would someone do this to Mindy and who would do this to her? It was very disturbing for Swenson to see Mindy in this condition. She was so vibrant and all of that, all of the bright and bubbly personality was gone. She was just a shell of who she once was. He was determined to find out who did this to her. She was so loved in this community. Sergeant Swenson knew the Valley City PD would not be able to handle this case on their own. So he immediately called his supervisor who called the Bureau of Criminal Investigation and they sent out Special Agent Mark Saylor to the scene. He arrived not too long thereafter and he looked over everything that Sergeant Swenson and Sather had seen. He determined that the person who did this had poured pine salt all over Mindy's head and body. He wasn't sure if this was just to desecrate the body or an attempt to remove evidence. What he did know was that he was going to need some of his own guys from the BCI to come and assist. So he called BCI partners Agent Arnie Rummel, a crime scene investigation specialist, and Agent Calvin Dupree, who was more of a interrogator, in-your-face kind of guy that's great at gathering information, speaking to witnesses, so on and so forth. Once the BCI agents arrived, they took a video as well as a number of pictures of this crime scene, 
while Sergeant Swenson went out and talked to neighbors and started to gather information outside. Within just 30 minutes, a number of people had come out of their apartments and they were standing in front of the building wondering what was going on. They saw officers putting up crime scene tape and they were asking if anyone saw anything out of the ordinary and a lot of the residents were shaken up by what was going on. This apartment building became a crime scene out of nowhere. This is a tiny community that's definitely not used to anything like this. One resident, Christina Judd, she was seven months pregnant. She was clutching her one-year-old daughter, Tiana, visibly upset over this entire situation. Chrissy and her husband, Mo Gibbs, they lived a floor below Mindy and they saw the flashing lights outside and they went out to see what was going on. Mo was actually a correctional officer for Valley City. He knew the officers and he was informed by his colleagues that a murder had occurred in their building. This sent shockwaves through the entire building and this community. Chrissy was scared. She said, I can't sleep here. I don't feel safe here. I gotta go. So of course, right after Sergeant Swenson asked them a few questions, they left this apartment building. They went to Chrissy's parents' house, which was close by, and she said she spent the night there. She couldn't sleep all night. She just remembers her husband holding her all night long because she was terrified. She couldn't believe that this could happen in their apartment building. She was tossing and turning all night. She was actually glad that her and her husband were in the middle of moving from this apartment building to her parents' house because she said she couldn't live there after this. I think I would feel the same way, especially if I thought where I lived was safe. I would wonder how in the world did this happen? I don't think I could sleep. I don't think I could eat. I would be so scared. I don't know if anything like this has ever happened to you, but I like hearing those things in the comments. I haven't had anything like this happen, but even things like a break-in or other crimes that have happened in my area that I've lived in before, I've been scared to go back to my apartment at that time. And now this apartment was a full-blown crime scene. When Chrissy and Mo were asked if they noticed anything out of the ordinary that day, Sergeant Swenson was hoping that they had. He knew Mo, they played together on a softball team, and he worked at the jail, so he would be an excellent witness because he was used to working in the law enforcement environment. And this was a close-knit community. Chrissy's dad, George Judd, worked as an athletic trainer for Valley City State University. Mindy was probably one of his students. Chrissy and Mo said that Chrissy was at work that day. They had lunch together with Chrissy and their little daughter, Tiana. And Mo did mention he smelled a very strong, distinct odor, like a cleansing disinfectant of some kind, in the afternoon. But other than that, he didn't hear or see anything. Chrissy's dad, George, had come over while Mo was watching Tiana and Chrissy was at work. He needed to get some information about Mo's wedding ring and to borrow Chrissy's car to drive to Fargo and pick up her mom from the airport. Later, when Chrissy got off work, they had a regular night. Then they saw the flashing lights. Swenson asked for Chrissy's father's information so they could follow up with him to see if he saw anything unusual when he came by that day. Then Swenson moves on to the next person in the crowd that he'd like to talk to and he sees him standing with a woman. It's the guy who went into Mindy's apartment with Danielle and took her pulse. The man tells Swenson his name is Robert Linz. He's not a resident, but the woman he was with, Shelly Rose, is. She lives in one of the bottom apartments in the building. She's the mother of Robert's daughter, Megan, who was just a child at the time, and he was there visiting that day. He said he heard someone screaming, so he looked out the door and heard it was coming from upstairs, so he went up there to see what was going on. He, too, mentioned that he smelled pine salt and that he saw the empty bottle underneath Mindy's arm and had remembered that overwhelming scent earlier in the afternoon. He said he'd only been inside Mindy's apartment a very short time before Swenson showed up. Just enough time for him to touch her arm and discover that she did not have a pulse. But he does tell Swenson, oh, I didn't touch her with my fingers. I used the back of my hand so that I wouldn't leave any fingerprints behind. He said he really didn't have to because anyone could see that she was dead. Okay, so not many people would be concerned with leaving fingerprints behind in time like this, so that definitely stood out. It's a very intense moment. If you're truly trying to help someone, you don't usually have time to think about anything else, but Robert had. So it's something that Swenson took note of. Then he asked Shelly if she had heard or seen anything or smelled anything unusual that day. Shelly said it was a normal day. Her adult daughter, Nicole, came by twice, once in the morning, after her shift, which was over at 7.30 in the morning, and then later in the day around lunchtime, a little after one, she did say she smelled pine salt around that time. She remembers that she went out to smoke a cigarette with Nicole, 
And as they walked out of the building, they could smell pine saw in the hallway. Swenson asked for her daughter's name. She said it was Nicole Thorson, and she provided him with her contact information so that he could reach out to her as well. Shelley said Robert came over after he got off work around 5.30 or so, and later when they heard the screams, he went upstairs alone without her to see what was going on. But she kind of started coming up the stairs as well with her young daughter. However, she told Swenson she stopped as she got near the hallway to Mindy's apartment because she could feel that something was wrong. She just did not want her daughter to see anything. But what she said next was even scarier. She said that a week earlier, someone tried to push in her door, but that she never reported it to police. But now, knowing what happened, it was terrifying to her. And she wondered if it was connected. While Swenson is talking to residents, officers have informed the new Salem Police Department about Mindy's death. A deputy that knew the family really well for the last couple decades, said that he would deliver the devastating news to her family. It was around 11 p.m. by the time he showed up at Rebecca and Jason's door that night. Rebecca could tell just by the look on his face that this was not going to be good news, but she never expected it to be as bad as it was. When the couple came to the door, the officer just said, I'm sorry to inform you, Rebecca, but Mindy's dead. Rebecca fell to the floor after hearing the news. And the deputy didn't have much else to tell them, except that Mindy died under suspicious circumstances. It just seemed unreal. Not Mindy. Why Mindy? Who would want to hurt someone like her? That's all Rebecca could think about. Someone so loving and kind, it just didn't make sense. The couple had the deputy go with them over to the family farm so that they could give her parents the news. Rebecca rang the doorbell, and she heard her father say, Who's there? He could see that Rebecca was visibly upset. She said, it's me, Dad. I've got some bad news. She looked at her mom, and she said, Mindy's dead. Eunice described getting the news like being stabbed right in the heart. She didn't want this to be real. She just kept wanting to believe that this did not happen. She loved Mindy so very much. She didn't understand how anything bad could have happened to someone like her. She ran into Mindy's bedroom screaming, she picked up a sweater that her daughter had left there, and she just wanted to take in Mindy's scent. She just held Mindy's sweater there and broke down in tears, were just streaming down her face. And all of these thoughts were coming back to her, all the memories that she shared with her daughter who was now gone. At this point, they don't know that she's been murdered. Remember, the new Salem deputy had said that he had limited information about what was going on. They just said that she died under suspicious circumstances, and her family wondered, what did that mean? They wanted to know what happened. They needed answers. But right now, they had to reach out to all of Mindy's friends and let them know the terrible news. And one of those friends was Mindy's childhood best friend, the one that went to VCSU with her, Ashley Wallace. Ashley got the call that night. It was really late, and she just kept repeating the same thing. No, no, no. They grew up together. They went to college together. They were birds of a feather. She drove right over to Mindy's apartment, and what she saw would stick with her for the rest of her life. She always had this moment etched into her mind. When she pulled up, she could see one of Mindy's windows. It was open, and the wind was blowing, the curtains and the light was on. It was like, it was like Mindy was there, but she knew she was gone. She just wanted to go up there and help her. She kept thinking, is someone up there with her? Is someone helping her? She knew it was too late for that, but she just kept thinking about her friend lying there by herself, no way for her to touch her, to hold her, to be there for her. It was too much for her to take in. She felt helpless in that moment. And by that time, in the middle of the night, many people had gathered over the last few hours. Friends from work, from school, they wanted answers. The team of investigators were there all night long into the early morning hours of the next morning, just scouring Mindy's entire apartment for clues. I have pictures of this crime scene. Of course, I'm going to censor Mindy, but there are a lot of things I examined as though I were there looking at the same evidence. I like that. I love looking at what investigators saw. So I'm gonna put some of those photos up on the screen. I will describe them for those who are just listening. First, let's start outside this building. There's a main door to the building. It's not secured with a lock of any kind, and it's shared by all of the tenants and the guests and everyone coming in and out. As you step inside, there's a stairway that goes up and down, one to the basement-style apartments below and one up 
to the other levels. Mindy lived on the second floor in apartment nine. In this picture, you can see right inside the front door, you'd come in facing the opposite way. So let me show you that now. Here's the view from the door coming into Mindy's apartment. You see a picture frame on the right hallway wall, a TV up ahead, and on an entertainment center. And this opening is where her bedroom is. But let's go back to the first photo. There's gray carpet, you see the mat with the shoes on it. This is a very short hallway. It's just a few feet until you would get to the door to Mindy's bedroom, which is on the right. The door was open and you can see inside there's her bed. There was also several handwritten notes taped to different walls. We will get to those in just a moment. If you continue straight, you're in her small living room. There's a TV, an entertainment center, and you can see she loved pictures. She had a lot of pictures of her friends, her family members all over the place. There's also an air conditioning above this area and a DVD player is below. She even had a little air freshener. And to the left is a sitting area with a couch. There's more pictures of her and her friends, a remote for the TV, a phone tucked away on the side table. And to the left of that, that's the open kitchen right off the living room area. There's a small table here with a bunch of pictures. They were laid out as though she or someone was going through them. There's also a portable CD player, a CD, maybe some contact solution. I always try to figure out what everything is. I even go on Reddit sometimes and post pictures of crime scenes asking the public what they see, especially when I'm stumped on something. And that did happen in this case, and I'll get to it. But there's a card, some film negatives you get when you develop pictures, and everyday stuff. Going back to that picture zoomed out, there's a picture of the linoleum flooring and the kitchen counter. Looking closely, I did notice some prescription bottles, a pair of blue kitchen cleaning gloves, some bread, just normal stuff. Here's a better view of the kitchen counter and the sink area, including the knife block where Mindy stored all of her sharper knives. Again, pretty standard kitchen. On the opposite side, there's a green refrigerator. Those are vintage now, for sure. Haven't seen one of those in a long time in person, but here's the top of it. More pictures, a calendar on the wall, another air freshener. As you can see, Mindy was very tidy, very organized. And that's why when I show you the clothing strewn around the room, you'll be able to tell it's out of place. Now that you kind of get a feel for the apartment layout, I wanna show you where Mindy was. She was lying across the hall, where the hall opens to the living room and where you would move towards her bedroom door. Her feet were facing her door with her head toward the kitchen area. Part of her hair was half on the carpet and half on the kitchen linoleum. You'd see her legs first as you came inside. You can see the coral shirt, her black pants, and the bottom you can see her white flip-flops on top of a pile of clothing. And that bag there, that's a crime scene text bag. It didn't belong to Mindy, so you can ignore it. Here's the coral shirt up close. It's on top of her white purse, and you can see her open wallet here. Now in this picture, I'll show you the whole thing, but first, I'm gonna zoom in. You can see there's an outline of a bottle. It's between her arm and her side. I know it's blurred, that's the way I got these photos, but I'm outlining where the bottle is. And here I'll put one on top. That is how they found the one next to her with the cap nearby right here. A close up of her wallet and I'm showing how there's nothing seemingly removed. Here you can see her unzipped purse with the strap still around her arm as well as the string of her lanyard still around her arm which held her keys. You can see the keys underneath, and this photo of her purse made me sad. I used to have one like that back then. It just really shows you that we are all so much alike. The little cute corduroy bag. Okay, now I'm blurring out the top of her head. You can see it's half on the living room floor and half on the linoleum of the kitchen floor. And above it, there are a few items of clothing. Back towards her feet again and toward the hall near her bedroom, you can see more items of clothing going into that hallway. They continued through the doorway to her room, and this is from the inside of her room looking back out. You can see tiny piles. Now coming into her bedroom, this is what you see. A bigger pile of loose clothing, as well as a laundry basket and clothes kind of hanging out of it. Close up, you see a picture frame, not attached to the wall, just leaning against it with more pictures of her friends, her family, I even recognize her ex-boyfriend Kyle, as well as her hairdryer and a fan on the floor. Here's her bedroom dresser. It looks like most of ours did when we were growing up. There's a boom box that really brings back a lot of memories. Stereo for the younger people watching. A lint roller's on there. There's a Victoria's Secret lotion bottles, little jewelry boxes, CDs, more pictures. And then there's this. This is what I couldn't quite figure out what it was. What do you think it is? 
I finally guessed it was a hair dryer diffuser cover because I have curly hair and so did Mindy. So it appeared to me to be similar to a hot sock or a collapsible diffuser, you tell me. But now let's get serious for a moment. I don't know if you noticed the handwritten notes that are all over the walls. I told you I'd mention those. Well, before I do, there's something I want to point out. I did see a comment here on my channel. I don't know if it was the only one, but I saw one comment that was accusing me of always speaking about a certain type of religious person in my videos and maybe singling out Christian stories. And I just want to tell you that I can 100% say without a shadow of a doubt, that is not true. I do not pick anyone based upon their belief system whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it's why I tell you about someone's belief system. It's because I truly believe if a victim believed in something, I'm not going to leave that out of my story. I learned back when I did my only survivor story on this channel with Christine Kent. I spoke to her on the phone, and she was almost in tears telling me about how big true crime shows took out everything about her faith. I can't do that. Even if it's something I don't agree with or that I don't follow, this is just my personal stance. I'm telling someone else's story. I'm going to be as factual as I can. So if they believed in God, I'm going to tell you they believed in God. If they didn't, you're probably not going to hear about it. Or maybe their religion was never mentioned in the research because someone else left that out. Reporters, family, I don't know. But I will always tell you exactly what I find when I do my research, which is why... I'm going to have some things at the end of this video that I wouldn't necessarily dive into, but I can't leave out because it's part of the story. And you'll hear that later on, but I did just want to mention this and point that out. But clearly, as you can see, all of these notes all over Mindy's apartment, they bear witness to the fact that she was a believer in Jesus Christ and that that was her Lord and Savior and her personal belief system. These are things that the officers took into account because they're building victimology. They want to know who their victim is. What did she do for a living? Who was she hanging out with? What was her belief system? Because those things are going to be put up against facts, different details of the case that they find. If this is normally not a person that, let's say, would, I don't know, do drugs, that's going to be an example of what the investigators might look at when something comes in that's counterintuitive or contrary to what they see on paper. Like in this case, it would be contradictory evidence. It doesn't mean that they're not going to take both of those pieces of evidence into account, but if it doesn't really add up with who they know the person is, they'll just question it. It's very important when you're trying to understand who would want to hurt someone. It matters. A person's lifestyle is very important when trying to piece together what happened to them in their final moments. So I just wanted to do that small, kind of long now caveat to tell you, no, I never choose a case based upon someone's belief system. What usually intrigues me is the person, who they were, what their character was like, and then of course, ultimately what happened to them. There are so many reasons I choose cases and a lot of them are suggestions from you. In this case, when they were investigating, they saw that there weren't just one or two. There were a number of notes written by Mindy put up on her walls, on her doors, on her mirrors, all around her apartment to remind her of what she believed in. For those of you that like to listen and not watch, I wanted to tell you what a few of these notes said. One of them that looks to be on her door of her bedroom or a cabinet said, Jesus lives in my heart. I, Mindy, am a child of God. I belong to the Lord. Today, tomorrow, and forever, Jesus Christ loves me, died for me, and forgives me. Mindy, for all of my faults, he heals brokenness. Another one said, I am secure. Thank you for Jesus covering me and touching my heart. Thanks for all your love. The one on her bedroom mirror said, Mindy, you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and forgiven by him. Praise be to God. There were notes everywhere, like I said. One was about praying for others. One was about the Lord helping her to make positive changes as a Christian for her Lord and for herself. When I read these, I get a feel for who Mindy was. But most of all, it shows me how desperate she was clinging to her faith to be healed. Remember, she was living in this apartment to go through chemotherapy infusions for that clinical trial. That's some scary stuff. You don't know what could happen to you. You could die. There are no guarantees. It's all experimental. And all this makes me sad to think what happened to her. It didn't look like anyone ransacked Mindy's apartment, tried to steal anything. However, I mentioned there were pictures missing from some of the picture frames. Several, actually, and investigators thought that was odd. 
Look at this frame in the living room right here. It's right near Mindy's body. There were at least four photos of her removed from it. Then look at this. At the wall unit, more pictures are missing from this frame as well. This stood out to them. In many cases, perpetrators will keep something that belongs to their victims. Pictures could certainly be one of those items. A person could have been obsessed with Mindy. The crime did seem personal. There was a belt wrapped around her neck. This person had to be close up and personal with her. They stabbed her. That's an intimate crime. The crime scene investigators took pictures of two knives and pulled one knife from her neck. Here you can see the blade is completely broken off and hanging from the handle. Both knives match the ones in Mindy's kitchen, which was just steps away from where she was now lying. It was overkill in the investigators' minds. Like someone was a very angry or enraged even. There were no signs of forced entry either. So perhaps Mindy knew this person or comfortable enough to let them into her apartment. Then Agent Rummel notices something very significant. Something underneath the fingernails of Mindy's left hand. It was a reddish color tissue, perhaps skin. Did she scratch her assailant? There was also some hairs in between Mindy's clenched fingers. They bagged her hands and her feet to preserve evidence. And if you've heard this but never seen it, this is what it can look like. Bags are tied with tape on the wrists and ankles to make sure that nothing falls out during transportation back to the medical examiner's office. They also did carpet clippings of suspected blood stains from the carpet, and here's a spot they took one from. This is what it looks like. There were also drops swabbed on Mindy's shirt as well. Finally, after hours of work, Mindy was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy and investigators could work on locating more people to interview. They wanted to build a timeline of Mindy's last movements, who she was, and what she was doing before she was killed. They had no idea when this murder happened or her cause of death. They were no closer to figuring that out yet. So now they turned to Mindy herself for clues, the victimology, understanding who she was, her routines, the people she knew, hung out with, where she spent her time, and anyone that could have had it out for her. They start with speaking with her mother and father. Eunice said that she talked to Mindy about everything. They could not think of one person who could do something like this to their beloved daughter. Eunice said that she spoke to Mindy on the phone the night before, and they had a wonderful conversation. And Eunice was supposed to come out and hang out with Mindy that day, the day that she died. But at the last minute, she decided not to. Eunice said that Mindy had let her know on that call, that it was okay. She didn't have to come out. She knew her mom was tired and had a lot going on. But now Eunice felt guilty that she wasn't there to protect her when she needed her the most, and she could never go back and change that. Her parents remembered the last time they saw her. It wasn't too long ago. She came to visit the family and help on the farm. She was loading bales of hay with her father. And usually when she said goodbye, she would drive out of the driveway and down the road and just kind of wave goodbye. But for some reason, when she started down the driveway, she stopped, she backed up her car, she jumped out, she ran to the house and gave her dad a big hug and said, I love you, dad. And he said, I love you too. And that was something that she never did before. So her dad said it was like, it was like something new that something was going to happen, but nobody knew what. How sad, but at least he had those moments with her and got to say goodbye. Eunice explained that Mindy was supposed to be going to a modeling shoot the day that she died. She said she didn't know much about it, but that Mindy had called her sister April asking for advice last Tuesday on what to wear. April said that Mindy found this job through the internet and that she had checked it out through the Better Business Bureau. But April remembered telling Mindy, you should be careful. This also explained the missing pictures from all those frames. That was Mindy. She pulled them out for examples of different looks and whatnot, so the investigators could rule out the perpetrator stealing those pictures. They do mention Tony's boyfriend, James Robinson, the same one the girls were trying to lie to the night that Mindy was killed. Mindy's parents said that he was not the nicest guy, and she really didn't like him because he would take things out on Tony, and at times things were really scary between them, so much so, and she was so worried about Tony, that she went to her mom and talked about the fact that James was on drugs and that she really wanted Tony to stop seeing him. And James knew that she wasn't a fan. So maybe he had something against her and he caught on that she was going to cover for Tony that night and they were lying to him. 
Would he go so far to check that night and see if Mindy was or wasn't with the girls and maybe it got out of hand? If he was on drugs, it wouldn't be out of the question that he could have gone into a rage because the crime scene seemed personal in nature. You have to be up close to strangle someone or use knives. And the knives were from her apartment, so the killer could have acted in the moment like it was unplanned. So investigators want to put James Robinson on their list of people to speak to. Investigators already spoke to April, Mindy's sister, and reached out to Mindy's brother, Michael. He had just returned from duty in Iraq. He was distraught over his sister's death, thinking he survived the war and she couldn't even get out of Valley City alive. He didn't have any new information to provide. He did say his sister was the type of person who would jump into a pool and not even check if there was water inside. That's how excited she was about life. And he just couldn't believe she was gone. Meanwhile, they're interviewing everyone in the building, as well as neighbors in the nearby apartments and homes, and Mindy's close friends. That morning, Mindy had made plans to meet with a friend, Jennifer Peters, and her daughter. Jennifer was planning to go to lunch with her husband and her three kids before meeting up with Mindy sometime around 1 o'clock. So, when she finished her meal, she called Mindy. It was around 12.46. The call went straight to voicemail, and Mindy never returned that call or any others. One of Mindy's friends, Lacey Undham, she had known her since preschool. She saw her at the university library at 11.30 a.m. and said that Mindy left sometime around 12.20 p.m. So investigators checked the school and Mindy logged off the library computer at 12.23 p.m. It only takes five minutes to get back to her apartment from the school. So investigators estimated she would have probably gotten back by 12.30 p.m. They already got statements from Tony and Danielle. I've explained everything already. Everything that they told the investigators, you have as facts in the story. Except that they had been trying to call her all day, and they hadn't gotten an answer, which was very out of the ordinary for her, and she missed a dinner that night with some of their friends. From the information that they gathered, it seemed as though Mindy had not been heard from after she was seen at the library. Investigators checked Mindy's phone, her cell phone, her home phone, and they noticed her first missed call was at 1247. So they estimate the attack happened sometime around that time. Something was happening that made her unable to answer, even though she had made plans that day. They get in touch with that resident Shelly Rose's daughter, Nicole. She had come to the building around that time. So they ask if she remembered seeing anything or hearing anything. She said she came a little before 1 p.m., and saw an unfamiliar man wearing a flannel walking behind her, coming into the door at the same time. A few minutes later, she and her mom went outside to smoke a cigarette, and that's when she could smell the pine salt in the hallway. Then they get in touch with George Judd. He's the father of the pregnant resident, Christy Gibbs, and he lets them know he was at his daughter's apartment with her husband around 3.30 on the 13th. He was on his way to Fargo to pick up his wife, Sue, from the airport. He did not notice anything out of the ordinary. He hung out, talking to Mo for a few minutes. He was just sitting on the couch with Tiana, his stepdaughter, George's granddaughter. And that was it. He didn't smell any pine saw at that time. With this information, investigators believe that Mindy was killed sometime between 12.30 and 1 p.m. That's a very small period of time. It also means that Mindy's been dead for nine hours when Tony found her body. By this time, the autopsy results were in, and Dr. George Mizell the state forensic examiner determined that the cause of Mindy's death was incised wounds to her neck and asphyxia. There were no signs of forced intercourse. However, they did take clippings and scrapings from her fingernails, and it was confirmed that there were human tissue underneath. So this was sent out to a lab, along with swabs from other areas for DNA analysis, and now they wait. At least a dozen CBI agents were interviewing family, friends, coworkers, anyone that knew Mindy. Ashley Wallace said that a few weeks before this, Mindy called her hysterically crying. She said, what is going on? And she kept saying, someone's trying to take me. She kept saying it over and over again. Ashley was like, what are you talking about? Mindy said she was standing outside her apartment when a man pulled up in a blue car, rolled down his window, and asked her for directions for a street that was like right around the corner. But then he got out of his car and ran after her. So she runs back inside her building as fast as she can. She told her mom, too, and they tell her, listen, call the police if you really feel like you are threatened. 
The word traveled fast, and Rebecca and her husband Jason heard about it as well. Mindy did call the police, and she made a report. But her friend said that even though Mindy was very outgoing, and she did have the tendency to trust people, she would get freaked out over certain interactions, and they joked that she was scared of her own shadow. So some people, like Jason, thought she could be overreacting a little bit, but now he's not so sure. The police report stated that according to Mindy, the man was in his 60s, he was described as a heavy white man, 5 feet 10 inches tall, driving a blue car that resembled a Ford Taurus. So now they'd be on the lookout for a vehicle matching that description. Detectives move on, and they do interviews with Mindy's coworkers. She worked at a restaurant in town as a waitress, and there was this older man that lived across the street in a motorhome. It was only a five-minute drive from where she lived. This man would come in. He would ask to sit at Mindy's table. He would annoy her and other women at the restaurant. He acted kind of strange, and Mindy complained to her coworkers that he made her feel uneasy. So they wanted to bring him in for an interview. His name was Ralph Albert Walters. They added him to their list of another person that they needed to speak with. Meanwhile, all the building residents are ordered to provide DNA samples to be sent out to the crime lab in case a DNA profile is created from the evidence collected at the scene. So one by one, they were coming down to the station on their own or when called in by an agent. First on their list of people was Robert Lind. Remember him? The one that used the back of his hand to take Mindy's pulse? So they bring Robert in for an interview. And they want him to know, you know what, we're just looking at everyone. It's standard procedure. But he cuts in and he's like, well, I understand you're probably looking at me a little harder. He was right. (laughs) He went in to check with Danielle and he was in the apartment when Swenson got there. True, he was assessing the situation and assisting. Or was he? Could he be setting up a reason why his DNA would be found there? I mean, he came up there pretty quickly without any hesitation, not knowing what was going on. He mentioned that he knows he stands out from everyone else. It's true. Robert was different from the farmer boys in town. He had a shaved head, a bunch of tattoos, and his style of dress kind of made him look like an outsider. Robert's lifestyle and appearance definitely would make him a target in this small town. He had only moved to Valley City a few months before Mindy's murder. Originally, he was from California. So the investigators ask if he even knew Mindy. He said he knew her in passing. He saw her every day. And he said... As far as he knew, she was just a pretty girl that lived in the apartment building, and when he passed her, he could feel her spirit. That's what he said. He said he could feel like she was a good person. The night that this happened to her, he said he was watching television in his apartment when he heard the commotion outside, and he went to see what was going on. They want to know why he touched her with the back of his hand, so he was honest. He told them, you know what? I've got a criminal record out in California. I did some things, got me in a little bit of trouble. So they run his name. Sure enough. Criminal record, just like he said. They want to know, what'd you get caught doing? He's like, I stole a car. I had a gun. I had some pot on me. And I was sentenced to about two and a half years in prison. But he says he's changed now. He moved there to be closer to his daughter. They have this small timeline between 12.30 and 1 p.m. when they think that this murder could have happened. They want to know where he was. He says... Nothing out of the ordinary happened that day. He had a regular day. He started work five minutes to seven and didn't get back to the apartment building until 5.30 that evening. But he did have a lunch break at noon. And he said it takes him about 45 minutes. And that's interesting because that's around the time they think Mindy was killed. While he's talking to these two detectives, they notice his hands. They were focused on the cuts up and down his arms. So they ask him, How'd you get cut up? He's like, oh, that's normal kind of business I do. I handle steel. It's just part of my construction job. I build steel buildings all day long. I get cut up. You're bound to when you do manual labor. But then there's just one finger that detectives see that has a Band-Aid on it. So they ask him, well, how'd you get that one? He says that one happened on September 13th. He cut himself pretty bad on a piece of steel. Really? Or was it when he was stabbing an innocent girl in her apartment? They really couldn't be sure. So they ask him, are you willing to give a DNA sample, a cheek swab? And he's like, sure. They tell him, we're doing it to everyone to rule them out. And he's like, absolutely. Anything you need, fingerprints, swabs, whatever you want. They do get a sample of his DNA and then they let him go. They didn't have anything they could hold him on at this point. And now they had to wait for results. Meanwhile, they do check with his employer and they actually confirm his alibi. And the fact that he does get cut up doing that job. So it's a mere waiting game once again. 
Who do you think they're going to bring in next? Tony's boyfriend, James, the one that Mindy didn't like. They ask him the same type of questions they asked Robert. Did you know Mindy? How? James says yes. He knew her from going to hang out with his girlfriend, Tony, at her work at her family's restaurant. Mindy worked there. She would be there. He said Tony and Mindy would get together. They would hang out. They would eat once in a while. And he was around sometimes. So he got to know her too. They ask him about his criminal record. And he knows they can check it. So why are you going to lie? So he doesn't. He said, yep, I got in trouble for illegal drugs. But that is in my past. Isn't it always when they're interviewed? He says, I'm trying to stay on the straight and narrow. I'm not trying to live that lifestyle anymore. But then they notice a pretty gnarly cut on his right hand. And they ask him what happened. He said, oh, <laughs> that, yeah. Went right through a window and bled like something fierce. Wow. And he's really not living the lifestyle anymore? Hmm. One of the detectives noticed that it was fresh and he even says it. He's like, it looks pretty fresh. So they want to know where he was on the day of the murder. James says he knows he had about four hours left of his community service from his previous charges. So that's what he was doing. And then he went to a friend's house and then he went home around 5.30 p.m. So they were able to call and verify both of those things. Just like in Robert's interview, they asked James if he's willing to give a DNA sample, and he agrees. Again, it's a waiting game, and it could take weeks to get the results back. Alibis are not concrete evidence, so they have to officially rule every single person out, regardless of whether someone confirms their whereabouts. Those are humans. They can make mistakes. It's not always accurate. Now it was time to track down Ralph Walters, the guy living in the mobile home who frequently came into Mindy's work. They call him in, and he tells detectives he's somewhat of a drifter, his words. He has no ties to the area. And this guy came off very odd. They wanted to know if he remembered anything about what he was doing on Wednesday the 13th that stuck out to him. He said he knows that that was the day he changed the oil on his motorhome, but he did not have a solid alibi. They also noticed a mark on one of his hands, just like what the other two men so they inquire about it. Ralph says, oh, that happened on Wednesday when I was putting the oil in. It's so interesting. He just happened to have a cut from the oil filter. James had one from busting in a window. Robert has cuts from work. I almost never get cuts. So for me, it's peculiar. But then I guess if you're working with your hands, it's not really that uncommon. I just thought it was interesting. The detectives ask Ralph about whether he had any run-ins at the restaurant or if there were any complaints about him. And he goes, no, I don't recall ever harassing anyone or having any issues. He said he didn't even have a clue who Mindy was. But that's not what her coworkers said. They said he was in there all the time. He had to have seen Mindy there. He gives his DNA sample just like everyone else did. They don't clear him though. They keep people of interest on their list until their DNA is officially ruled out. Now that they've spoken to every individual who stood out as suspicious, they have to move on to everyone close to Mindy, starting with her current boyfriend, Jordan Raynham. This is all happening within the first 48 hours after Mindy was found. And you know, they always look at the people that are closest to the victims. Jordan was from a local farming family. He and Mindy had been in a relationship for over a year now. And he was a good guy. He was soft-spoken, clean-cut, church-going, doesn't mean much. But from all accounts, everyone said, they didn't suspect he would do anything like this. In his spare time, he loved driving around and showing off his brand new Corvette, and he proudly drove Mindy around in it all the time. He spent a lot of time with her. He liked to take her to visit his family. Everyone had good things to say about Jordan, except Jason had a suspicion. Even though everyone said, no, I couldn't see him doing it. Jason's like, you know, he's pretty possessive of Mindy. There were times when she was trying to spend time with her family on her farm, and he would come around unannounced, sort of unhappy that she wasn't with him, and he would try to take her away. There was one time he remembered where Mindy blatantly had to tell him, please leave me alone. So they brought Jordan in. They wanted him to take them through the night before and then during the day that Mindy was murdered. He told investigators the couple went to Stop and Go store to get something to drink that evening, and then they went to rent a movie. Remember those days? I used to love that. I think Blockbuster might be coming back. But then he left. And then the next morning, when Mindy woke up, she called him at exactly 10.45 a.m. The thing is, they only spoke once, and that wasn't normal. He said she usually called him about 10 times throughout the day. 
Jordan said he was working on his family farm all day long and that he never heard from Mindy again. The investigators asked him if he would agree to a DNA sample and a polygraph. And this guy was distraught. The entire interview, he was crying. He was trying to hold his composure. And during this polygraph, I mean, he couldn't even hold it together. He just lost his girlfriend. It would be really hard to sit through questions like that. Questions like, did you harm Mindy and cause her death? So his results, inconclusive. He told the examiner, this is just too stressful for me. But was it that or was it something else like guilt? At the end of his interview, he told investigators that he loved Mindy. He was in love with her. He gives them a sample of his DNA, and again, they wait. I know this is a lot, but this is nothing compared to all of the interviews that were carried out in this case. I'm just highlighting ones that I found to be important or relevant, or the ones that had the most information to gain. But this is a daunting task, and they still really have no leads. But on day three, there's a break in this case. This one threw me for a loop. While analyzing Mindy's phone, investigators find very disturbing voice messages that somebody was leaving for her and the weirdest ones were actually left for her after her murder. There were a number of these calls and messages. It wasn't just like one isolated incident. There were a lot of them. And it's a man's voice on these recordings. Here's part of one of those messages. He says, you know my number, sweetie. I miss you. I love you. You're my inspiration. Please help me. Please help me, Mindy. And he was crying at this point in the message. He goes on to say, I can't continue without you. Please help me in some way. Help me. This was too strange for investigators to ignore. Who was this man? So they traced the call to a guy named Rodney Kuznia. Well, the last name was familiar to investigators because Mindy's family and friends mentioned that one of Mindy's ex-boyfriends was Kyle Kuznia, the one that she met when she was a freshman. Remember him? He was homecoming king. He broke her heart two years ago. They had been in a serious relationship and Kyle wanted to break up. But wait, get this, because this was crazy. Rodney is Mindy's ex-boyfriend Kyle's father. That was the man's voice that you just heard. That's Kyle's dad. He was exchanging a ton of calls with Mindy and it was mutual. They were both calling one another quite a bit. So investigators are stunned. It seems very odd that an ex's dad would be in contact with Mindy in this manner, saying the things that he did, it didn't add up to them. Rodney becomes their prime suspect at this point. It's not uncommon in so many cases that a murderer will call the victim after they commit the murder to make it look like, oh, they were unaware that the victim is deceased. It's a way for them to build an alibi. Jody Arias, anyone? She was the queen for post-mortem phone voice messages. Remember that? He says, Mindy, it's Rod. I know what happened to you. I just love hearing your voice. And again, he's crying. And then he says, I can't take it. I love you, kid. God picked a beautiful flower. I'm sorry this happened the way it happened to you. Wow. Just wow. He seemed completely infatuated with her. And it was obvious to the detectives that this man wanted more than a friendship. He wanted something romantic. First, they want to bring in his son, Kyle. They want to start there because that's where this connection was made. Mindy and Rodney knew each other from Mindy dating Kyle. So they needed to bring Kyle in anyway because he's another person of interest on their list at the time. Mindy's friends had told them she still had feelings for Kyle, but Kyle was the one that wanted to end everything. And Kyle was actually planning on marrying somebody else now. So that relationship was completely over in Kyle's mind. And unlike his father, Kyle did not keep in contact with Mindy after their breakup. The relationship lasted about two and a half years and they'd been broken up for a while now. So would he have a reason to be involved? They didn't know. But they had to rule him out just like everyone else. Kyle explained what we already know about how they met and everything in the relationship. However, he did mention the relationship was rocky, which was one thing that they were quite surprised about considering all the good things that they heard from everyone else. He described the relationship as really tough on him. It was hard, they were always arguing, and it got worse after Kyle graduated. He moved an hour away, like I had said, and Mindy was paranoid. She thought that Kyle was going to find another girl. Even though he kept reassuring her, I'm not, I'm with you, that's not gonna happen. But after a while, 
The long distance just wasn't working for them. Ever since the breakup, he hasn't been in contact with her. However, about seven months ago, Mindy showed up at his apartment unannounced. And Kyle admitted he wasn't happy about it. He was dating someone else by then, and he didn't have anything to say to Mindy. So when she showed up, he let her know that. He told her to leave. Mindy stood there in tears. But Kyle, he didn't back down. Now he's telling the investigators he wished he would have handled that situation differently, and he hadn't spoken to her since. The investigators check into Kyle's alibi, and it's true, he was out of town for work on the day of Mindy's murder, so he was not involved. Now they want to focus their questions on what he knows about Mindy and his father. What kind of relationship did they have? Kyle immediately lets them know he was not okay with his dad keeping in touch with Mindy. He actually told him he didn't want him talking to her. Kyle figured it was better to get them to stop now before they formed an even closer bond. He had a woman in his life he was planning to marry, so he kept thinking, let's say 10, 20 years down the line, if they're still talking, that's going to be weird. Kyle had moved on, and he felt it was inappropriate for his father to maintain this relationship with his ex. He also added he knew that she was getting information about him from his dad. He was aware that they would still talk and his dad would say things like, you know, Mindy's doing this, Mindy's feeling this way, you know, she wants to know what's going on. And Kyle didn't care. He didn't like that his dad was sort of being a messenger. As a matter of fact, Kyle explained his relationship with his father was strained because of the contact he had with Mindy. It was ruining his relationship with his dad. This was a situation where Rodney would call Mindy multiple times a day, even come visit her. Kyle felt like his dad had a very unhealthy attachment to her. He asked his dad, what is it going to take for you to stop talking to her? And by the way, Kyle's mom and dad are still married. So this is a married man in contact with the ex-girlfriend of his son. It's strange. Kyle's mom does find out about these calls. And she's very upset. She confronts Rodney. And she says, you know, that's wrong. You're married and you're talking to this younger gal. And Kyle agreed. So at this point, they let Kyle go. And they start to question Mindy's friends about Rodney. They told the investigators that Mindy saw Rodney as a father figure. It was not romantic in her eyes. It was a way for her to keep tabs on Kyle, the person that she really wanted to be with. However, as time went on, she got into this new relationship with Jordan, and Mindy had mentioned that she kind of wished that Rodney would stop calling. One reason, because it made Jordan feel uncomfortable. It was inappropriate, but Mindy was too nice to say anything. But now investigators are wondering, did Mindy finally have the courage to tell him to stop. Maybe it made him angry enough to do something drastic. They finally bring Rodney in and confront him about everything that they've uncovered. The investigators start questioning him right away about what his relationship with Mindy was like. They said, we don't quite understand it, Rodney. He said, well, you have to know Mindy to understand it because she was quite the bubbly character. And then he said this, Mindy reminded me so much of my wife in her younger days. Okay, is that strange? I couldn't really tell. It's like, if she reminds him of his wife, then it does seem like that's romantic in nature. He explains that it started out that they would just keep in touch once in a while, like once, maybe twice a week, but it was really hard to catch her. She was a really busy person, so he would leave her a message, and then it was kind of like back and forth. At first, they would chit-chat mostly about Kyle, asking things like, you know, whether she still had a chance with him, what he was doing, like her friends mentioned, keeping tabs. But from this, they developed a friendship, and they began talking about a lot of other things. They even talked after Rodney's wife found out, except in his version, his wife didn't care at all. He said, oh, it's nothing serious. You know, I just told my wife it's a friend, and I, I really needed a friend. So he said, are you really going to take my friend away from me? It's very interesting. According to Rodney, even Kyle understood his relationship with Mindy because he said Kyle asked him, are you still talking to Mindy? And he told him yes. And he said Kyle's response was, well, if it was that important to you, then I guess it's fine. But that's not what Kyle told investigators. Rodney does admit at one point that Mindy kind of questioned whether they should end their little chit-chats. But Rodney couldn't let go. He says, besides, he straight up asked her, should I just stop calling you? And she said, no, 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 don't do that. He says if she would have told him to stop, he would have had to let her go. But then out of nowhere, Rodney was like, you know, I'm telling you guys a lot of things here. Probably shouldn't have. You know, my wife might divorce me over it. Like what? Well, of course, investigators were curious too. So they said, tell us what you mean, Rodney. And he's like, well, you know, I was meeting with Mindy. 
They would go out for meals together, and he was even giving her money. He had just seen her before the murder, and he said he gave her $100 because she was supposed to be flying down to her brother's wedding in Washington, and she was short on cash. Rodney let the investigators know that at first, Mindy didn't want to accept the money. But Rodney insisted, saying that he tried to scare her by saying, if you don't take it, I'm going to go spend it on booze at the bar. And Mindy didn't want that for Rodney. So she took it. And she thought it was a 20. But then when she opened it up and noticed it was $100 bill, she's like, no, 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 you cannot give me this. He's like, that's your money. I'm just trying to help you out. He told her she was like a little daughter to him, and he'd help his daughter in the same way. Well, after hearing this, investigators are actually even more suspicious of Rodney. He's keeping secrets from his wife. He's making special trips. He's giving Mindy money, not to mention the odd messages. So they ask him about those messages he left for Mindy. He admits he found out she was murdered and he called. He left those messages and he knows it's stupid, but he really just wanted her to pick up again. So they asked, what did you tell her? He repeats the same messages we heard that God picked a perfect flower, all that. He said, I just wanted to hear her voice again. And now for his alibi. He tells them he was working on his farm from early morning to the evening and that he left after his wife went to work, which is around 7.30 a.m. He drove two miles out to his farm and met his son, Kirk. He gave them a minute-by-minute account of his day, and they'd have to check it all out. He also agreed to a DNA sample, and they let him go for now. Yes, the messages were strange. But when I heard them, I did start to think they kind of sounded like someone that was grieving, who wanted to hear her voice. And she did have one of those voice recordings where it actually said, hey, it's Mindy. It wasn't a pre-recorded bot with saying like, leave a message for blah, 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 blah. So maybe it is strange, but not as strange as we thought. I wasn't sure. It was definitely odd to have an ex-boyfriend's dad keeping in touch. That's for sure. But did he kill her? Well, he's a person of interest for sure. Until they checked his alibi and realized he was 200 miles away eating with his family at the time that Mindy was murdered. The community is on edge. Women are afraid in their own homes. No one wants to go out. They're afraid someone will follow them back to their place and it'll be a repeat of what happened to Mindy. It's really frightening. And it made me think about something. Men. Do men feel the same fear in these instances? And I don't mean to be offensive and I hope no one would take it that way. But I wonder about this because I can tell the differences between men and women, at least the ones in my life. I've had boyfriends in the past who never locked their doors and it would shock me. But I also have a father that was in prison when I was growing up, so he would tell me stories. And once I was old enough to understand everything, he would warn me about my safety. So I did have a different perspective. Still, do men fear the same things women do? I think not, because women are killed for their bodies all the time by men. So I could be wrong, but anecdotally, I've seen a difference between the way a man and a woman reacts to these sort of crimes. It's sad. So many women in the small community were fearful they thought they would be next, especially Mindy's friends. They no longer felt safe in their community. Ashley said she couldn't even take a shower or be alone or do the simplest task anymore because she thought that someone would be waiting for her right behind that shower curtain. Not just Mindy's friends were afraid, residents of the apartment were afraid. They wanted answers. Some of them didn't even want to live there anymore. The Valley City PD held a press conference and they told the community to be careful, to be aware of their surroundings, that they were still looking for the person who did this. The last homicide in that city was in 2003. It was a triple homicide of Sharon Hatcher, she was 42 years old, her 16-year-old daughter April, and her 21-year-old friend Michael Barnett. All three of them were shot to death, and another man in the neighborhood was shot, but he survived the ordeal. The person responsible was Daniel Jensen. He was a former Valley City bar owner and Sharon's ex-boyfriend, who apparently had jealousy issues. He said he snapped one night when he was doing drugs. And he went over there and went crazy. Wow. And now there's Mindy. The detectives followed up on more than 200 leads and dozens of people came forward and were interviewed. And they had no suspects. Mindy's parents felt suspended in time. They felt like the world didn't exist. The only thing they could think about was Mindy. Nothing else mattered. They wanted answers. And waiting was so hard. They wanted to know details about her case, but I'm sure you know, police have to keep these things quiet. The parents weren't given much information, but the news came in from the crime lab 
that they were able to create a DNA profile from that tissue underneath Mindy's fingernails. Now, they could compare it to all of those DNA samples that they were collecting, and then they could run it through CODIS to see if they got any hits. Six days after the murder, at 2 p.m. Tuesday, September 19th, Mindy's family held her funeral in the hometown of New Salem in the high school gym where she used to wear the number 24 jersey playing basketball. They chose this location due to the number of people who said they wanted to attend. They had a thousand people or more at this service. They knew that was not going to be feasible at the church. Their service was led by Mindy's brother-in-law, Jason. He was a pastor. He had the right words to say, and he knew Mindy so well. A basketball was placed in the hoop above the pastor's head, and they knotted the strings at the end so that the ball would stay in place as a symbol of the sport that Mindy loved so much. Everyone was crying. It was hard on all of her loved ones. And the police were actually there undercover. They were on scene scoping out all of the guests in there to protect the family because they didn't know who was targeted. So as people are there to pay their respects, there's a sense of fear over them. They're afraid of what could happen to Mindy's family. Mindy's father was paranoid and he said he would be until they caught who did this. Mindy was laid to rest in Graceland Cemetery in New Salem. Many people who loved Mindy came forward to speak about her and the memories they had. Doug Peters, the athletic director for the university, said that he and Mindy became very good friends shortly after he came to the university in 2004 as the director. She was always so bubbly. She didn't just walk into a room, she bounced into a room. She was close to his family and loved his daughters. He said she was one of the nicest people he had ever met. She really loved kids. And she's someone that he hopes his daughter will be like one day. Mindy's boyfriend, Jordan, spoke as well. He said, I don't think anyone could have met her and said hello to her and forgotten her. And I hope that they didn't. Because if they did, they missed out on someone special. There's a heart-shaped garden that was created in Mindy's memory out in Valley City. It's a place where her loved ones can come to remember her. A day after the funeral, on September 20th, investigators get their biggest lead yet. A DNA match to what they retrieved from Mindy's fingernails, but it's from an unsolved case from Fargo, North Dakota, dating back two years from 2004. A semen sample was taken from a woman who claimed that a man had forced himself on her against her will. At the time, they couldn't find a match, and she described the man who hurt her as a black male. He was muscular, over six feet tall, and over 200 pounds, probably in his late 20s, maybe early 30s. Well, the investigators on Mindy's case want to go talk to this woman, so they drive out to Fargo, and she agrees to meet with them. She was only 22 and a college student when she was attacked. She was studying to become a teacher. She said one night she was out celebrating with a few of her friends, and they went to a concert and a fair, and then they went out to a bar to drink, and the last thing she remembered was getting some water and telling her friend she would be right back. She was going to the restroom, but she didn't come back. She had been drugged. She woke up with a strange man on top of her in a place she had never been. She was actually pinned down on her stomach and he was behind her with his hand over her mouth so she couldn't scream. She tried to fight, but he was twice her size and very strong. She actually thought that she was going to die that night, but he did let her go. He told her there was a cab waiting outside. She didn't even have shoes on. She was terrified. She was worried that he was going to chase her down and kill her. So she screamed while she ran down that hallway until someone let her inside one of the rooms. I think it was a hotel that she was at. And she fell down in front of them, just screaming and crying for them to call 911. She was taken to a hospital nearby where they did a vaginal swab. She had bruises all over her thighs and other parts of her body. The nurse examiner said this was the worst case of its kind that she had ever seen. And the victim said, he was going to kill me. They were able to get a sample of this DNA but it never matched to anyone until now. This poor girl had lost hope over the last couple of years. She was destroyed. She couldn't go out in public without feeling terrified of what would happen. It was devastating. She was finally starting to heal. She graduated from college, she became a teacher, and now she'd just gotten this call that the DNA in her case matched the one in Mindy's murder. That was shocking, but not as shocking as this next piece of information they'd been given. All of their prime suspects were ruled out. Kyle's dad, the guy from the mobile home, the neighbor who checked her pulse with the back of his hand, and everyone else on their list that gave DNA samples. But now they had a description. 
They were still waiting, they were still collecting DNA samples, but now they could concentrate their efforts on anyone with these specific attributes of the person who hurt the victim in Fargo. Tall, dark, muscular. Well, there weren't that many people that Mindy spent time with that matched that description, but there was someone in the building who did. On the basement level, he already spoke to investigators and willingly came down to the station to give them a sample of his DNA. He was also someone they knew. Remember Mo Gibbs, the 34-year-old correctional officer, husband of the pregnant woman Chrissy? They didn't have a reason to believe they needed to look into him any further. They already knew a lot about the couple. They had met a couple years ago after Chrissy had recently got out of a relationship, and she found out she was pregnant with her first daughter. Mo stepped up. He cared for her during her pregnancy, even though it wasn't his child. And he was great with Tiana. He treated her like it was his own daughter. They had opposite schedules. He worked at night at the jail, and so he would watch Tiana during the day when Chrissy was at work. Soon after Tiana was born, Chrissy got pregnant with Mo's baby, and they just got married in June of this year, and they were expecting their first child in the next couple months. Sergeant Swenson really did not want to point fingers at someone just because he was one of the few people who matched the description of a man who attacked a woman in Fargo a couple years before. Mo was imperfect. They knew he came from a large family, that his parents were very young when they had him. His mom was like 15, his dad was 20 at the time, and he grew up in a rough area. He had been involved in gangs, even became a Crips gang member growing up in California. But he changed his life around when he went into the Navy. Then he played college basketball and had been married and divorced, and then had moved out to North Dakota to be closer to his mom. And now he helped keep bad guys behind bars. Mo was one of the local law enforcement officials who were just honored at a September 11 breakfast in Valley City. This was just a few days before Mindy's murder. He was in pictures right next to the men who were working on this very case. And just the Sunday before, he had played in a softball tournament on Sergeant Swenson's co-ed team. He was also the coach of the third and fourth grade boys basketball team for Valley City Parks and Rec. And he'd been doing that since January until March of that year. Well, even though he's one of their own, they had to go back and make sure everything checked out. They had to make sure anyone matching the description of the man with the DNA match in Fargo had their DNA submitted to the crime lab. Finally, they get a call back with more shocking information. They got a match. And Swenson was like, who? He was shocked when he heard the name. Were they sure? The analyst is like, I retested the DNA and I confirmed. It's definitely a match. Mo. Someone who had literally worked with them in law enforcement. This is someone close to them that they knew personally, someone they trusted. He's a correctional officer at the Barnes County Jail. How could he have done this? It didn't make sense to them. But they had to look into him. It's their job. Even if they had doubts that he had done this, he had willingly come in just a few days ago, like all the other residents, to provide a sample of his DNA. And now his DNA was matched to a case in Fargo with the 22-year-old college student and now this. So they come up with a plan because they don't want to tip him off. They said, hey, Mo, we're just following up. We have a few more questions. We're just asking a couple residents to swing by for a few minutes. Mo truly did not suspect anything. He had his one-year-old stepdaughter in tow. But the whole time, they had undercover cops. He was under surveillance. They were taking pictures and video. That's how we have this picture of him walking in with Tiana. They escort him into an interview room, and he's with Tiana. The 15-month-old was just clinging to him. It was so cute. It was definitely an emotional moment for the officers. And they did have to take Tiana and put her in another room. And then they began the interview. They were hoping it wasn't Mo. And I know what you're thinking. They have the DNA. It has to be him. But wait. Just wait. Because I'm telling you, this is a very interesting case. This is why I wanted to do it. I'm not a scientist. If you are... I definitely urge you to leave a comment so we can better understand this, but when they scraped and clipped Mindy's fingernails, they were able to get only 41.2 nanograms of DNA, and not all of that belonged to Mo. I don't want to get into all of this right now, but DNA is considered to be more reliable than any other kind of crime scene evidence. This is exactly why DNA samples of suspects are collected by law enforcement officers, even from people who are the least bit connected. DNA is so much more reliable than any other evidence. Also, it can be collected and then it can be stored so it can be compared to future or past crimes. However, if you've been watching CSI on trial, I talked about it a couple weeks ago when I did a sponsorship with CuriosityStream. 
This is not sponsored, this part of my video, not at all, but I will leave my coupon code below in case you wanna sign up because I am obsessed with this new show. It literally calls out all the flaws in crime scene investigations and I've been stunned by what I'm learning. But I'll save all that until we hear what Mo has to say. So let's get into it. Officers want to lock down Mo's whereabouts between 12.30 and 1 p.m. That small window. Where was he? First, they asked him the obvious. Do you know Mindy? He said, yeah, I'm familiar with her. You know, I know she's a resident. Saw her come and go. And then he says on the day of the murder, he left the apartment around 11.30 a.m. He went to lunch with Tiana and Chrissy. He thinks they finished around 12.35. He drops her off nearby at work. He goes back to his apartment with Tiana. It's apartment one on the basement floor. He thinks he probably got home around 12.45. That's the exact time frame that they think Mindy was killed. He said he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. He was busy packing up moving boxes, but he did mention the smell of disinfectant. He said that at the time, he thought it was probably the manager of the building cleaning an apartment upstairs. He was only there for maybe 10 minutes because he was packing up a truck full of their moving boxes and taking them to his in-laws. He said he made one of those trips and he thinks he was there for about an hour. Then they ask him, when do you think you last saw Mindy? And he answered, it was probably like a week before her murder. They asked him, have you ever been inside her apartment? And he says, well, one day I saw her coming home and she was holding her pants, a laundry basket and a book bag. So I asked her if she needed a hand and she said, sure. So I helped her take it up to her apartment, but that was it. That's the only time he'd ever been to her apartment. Wow. The detectives are stunned. He just described the crime scene, a scene that they had never released any information about. No one else knew what was behind the door to apartment nine, but somehow Mo, someone that said that he didn't really know Mindy, didn't have any connections to her. Now he says he had been inside her apartment before and he just recreated the exact scenario that they believe happened on the day she was murdered. That's exactly what happened in their minds and mine after looking through those crime scene photos. That's why I showed you and described them to you. Her whole apartment is tidy, except for those clothes scattered around. Clean clothes. They had a communal laundry room downstairs, and this was an opportunity to catch Mindy in a vulnerable position. Her hands were full, she's unable to fight ambushed and pushed inside, but why? It seems like Mo is looking for a reason for his DNA to be inside her place, an excuse for any connections that they may find. So they ask him if he would take a polygraph just to rule him out, since now he's admitted to going inside of her place and they just, they just wanna clear him. At least that's what they said. Even though polygraphs cannot be admitted in courts, they can sometimes scare someone into telling the truth. So they press him further during the polygraph asking, did you injure Mindy and cause her death? To which he replied, no. And of course, they asked him a number of other questions. And of course, following the tactic, the examiner lets him know that there were signs that he had been deceptive. And now they wait to see if he breaks. The examiner's like, you know, it seems to indicate there's something bothering you about this situation, so let's try to resolve it. To which Mo says, he doesn't know anything about it because he wasn't there. Now, the detective uses his biggest piece of evidence to see what Mo's gonna say. He said, what do you know about DNA? And Mo says, nothing. The detective says, what if I told you that your DNA was found on Mindy's body? And Mo kind of scoffs. He says, well, I would tell you that's not true because I wasn't there. Now, there are agents watching Mo's interview from another room and they notice that he's not really getting scared. He doesn't seem worried. He actually seems pretty calm. So the detective straight up tells him, we found your DNA under Mindy's fingernails. At this point, he looks frustrated. He says, well, I don't know how my DNA is under her fingernails. That's when the examiner says, well, you can't argue with science. And I want to stop for just a minute because we can argue with some science because there are advances all the time. Like I told you, I've been watching that CSI on trial, and it is incredible. DNA is not an exact science. Ballistics, not exact. These investigations, they're not perfect. Footwear impressions, bite marks, the list goes on. What's crazy is that technology moves forward, and the law looks towards the past. The law looks towards precedent that's already been set, and it's very hard to change the mind of the court. Not to mention that these so-called experts that I've actually always trusted until recently, 
I mean, I used to want to be an expert witness. That's why I studied what I did. I had dreams of making that my job. But I see now that a lot of them care about their reputations. That's how they make the big bucks. So of course, they side with the prosecution or the defense because that's why they were hired. Because they believe that they can make a case out of all the evidence in the direction of whatever side wants it to lean. And in the CSI on trial show, they show that these experts even went so far as to fabricate, meaning to lie about their research, to lie about the results. And that ended up putting an innocent person behind bars and worse to death. So I'm actually in limbo on what I believe. I know I don't trust polygraphs. I know they're just a tool to scare people. I don't trust much circumstantial evidence. So you gotta personally give me more. And that more is usually DNA. At this point, the examiner tells Mo that he's gonna let him in on something else. He says, your DNA matches an unsolved case from two years ago out in Fargo, where a woman was forced to have intercourse against her will. At this point, Mo is shaking his head. He's like, no, he denies it. He's like, I live there. I had plenty of uh, sexual encounters, but I did not force anyone. And he tries to explain what happened. He goes, yeah, a few times I picked somebody up at a bar, went somewhere, but I know for a fact I never forced anyone. I even personally saw a news article where he said that he had a thing for blondes, and it could have been the more than 15 women he recalls taking back to a hotel or somewhere back then. Essentially, he's accusing the Fargo College student of lying. Even though it was proven by a nurse that handles those type of cases, this was indeed forced, and she was shrugged and injured. And a witness saw her in that hallway before banging on the door and begging them to call the police. Seaman was tested. It was his. She described the man who did this to her, and he matched Moe's description. The detective is not backing down. Even with all of Moe's excuses, he tells him, the only thing that's going to help you right now is to cut your losses. Moe was like, well, I had nothing to do with this. I know that. But they had his DNA at the crime scene, so they arrested Moe Gibbs on the spot for the murder of Mindy Morgenstern. And this arrest shocked a lot of people. First, it shocked his family. Chrissy, his wife, could not believe it. No one wanted to believe it. People were coming forward in his defense, and not just locally. There were people coming from all over the place, different states that he had lived in, basketball coaches, ex-girlfriends, colleagues from other jobs that he'd had over the years, his own family. They said there is no way the Mo killed anyone ever. There had to be another reason for his DNA to be there. And I read so many of these articles where people who knew Mo, loved him, came forward and said, he's gentle, kind, generous, and they would never believe he did this. And I had to imagine what his wife would feel like in that moment. How shocking would it be? This man was with your newborn daughter, now an infant, all alone with this man. He's hugged her and comforted her when the news spread about this murder. All along, you're telling me that he's the monster? I would be hurt confused and shocked. I don't know how I would deal with it. And I've said this before, you don't just stop loving someone automatically, even if you know that they did something this bad. Logically speaking, most people are going to make the decision to distance themselves, but Chrissy had a lot to think about. Her dad liked Mo. He said that he was there that day at their apartment. He stopped by at 3.30 and Mo was completely normal. He didn't see anything wrong, no cuts or blood. And Mo wasn't acting strange. It just didn't make sense to anyone who knew him. Even Sergeant Swenson tried to get Mo to confess. He's like, you've got kids, Mo, just like I do. What are you going to tell them when they get older? But Mo just looked at him and said, Dave, I didn't do this. When Mindy's family heard the news that someone was arrested, they were shocked. They couldn't believe that this random person, someone that Mindy would have felt safe around because remember, she mentioned moving there and feeling comfortable because there were law enforcement presence. The arrest brought even more questions than answers. One thing was Mo didn't appear to have any scratches on his hands. On September 18th, he came in and gave that DNA swab. However, when they looked at his hands again when he was arrested, they did notice two scratches. One was on his right wrist, which looked shallow and almost healed over. I'm going to show it to you here. And the other one was on the back of his left hand, and that one was kind of deep. It wasn't completely healed yet. So they asked him what happened. He said he cut himself while moving boxes on September 14th. And again, when putting his stepdaughter into her car seat on the 15th. Both days were after the murder. I looked at the cuts, and I'm not an expert. So I went and found some samples online of what defensive scratches look like. And you know what? They do look similar. 
Here they are side by side so you can get an example. And Mo was very strong. I don't think Minnie would have had much of a chance to do that much damage to him. I don't want you to think this is over. I told you there were things that I have to mention and they're coming up. I did so much research into this because I go into these cases in time sequence. I read articles in the order they're happening. And I also started questioning the science, not about the assault in Fargo. I knew Mo did that. But considering Mindy did not appear to the detectives to have been attacked in the same way, she was fully clothed and stabbed, I just wanted to look a little more into it to do my due diligence, just like the DA and the defense were doing at the same time. Soon, I got so many different pictures of who Mo Gibbs was, or who he was before he got to Valley City. When they started looking into his background, they were able to find out he actually changed his name. It used to be Glenn Dale Morgan Jr., his birth name. He changed it to Mo Maurice Gibbs. And this change took place August 15, 2005. But why? The court records indicated his reason was his father had abandoned him as a child and he was never part of his life. So he no longer wanted to be known by his last name. This new name had an origin story too. One that set a pattern in motion in my research. Girls, his weakness, women, sex, blondes, as he put it, seemed to be his Achilles heel. Where it stemmed, I can't be sure. But as he said, his father abandoned him as a child. His father, a child himself, at only 20 when he was born, and his mom, Diane Gravely, only 15. Maybe it was mommy issues. But Mo seemed to cling on to women. The thing that he appeared to like the most was the honeymoon phase, as people like to call it. The beginning of a relationship, the excitement, the newness, being the prince charming and coming to women's rescue, sweeping them off their feet. Many of them had very positive things to say about Mo. But as soon as he would show up in their lives, he would leave, sometimes without warning, many times leaving pregnant girlfriends, fiancés, and even wives behind, never hearing from him again for the most part. And this intrigued me. Ladies' man is an understatement. I couldn't wait to get to this part. I was in my kitchen last night telling my boyfriend all the details and I felt like you were my best friends that I was waiting to spill all of the juicy tidbits too. So Mo was born Glenn Morgan, as I said, his legal name. And he was born August 10th, 1972 in Atwater, California. He was raised by his maternal grandmother and then he got into gang life as a teenager. He was getting into a lot of trouble and he was given the choice to either go to jail go to boot camp or go into the military. And he decided to straighten his life out and go into the Navy in 1990 when he was 18 years old. In 1991, he got married. The woman's name was Tasha McGraw. She was also serving in the Navy with him. However, while he was married and living on the Naval base in Washington, he would frequently go out to nightclubs in Seattle. And that's where he met Cheryl Go. She was visiting one night from British Columbia across the border and she had no idea that Mo was married. He acted like a perfect gentleman, and they hit it off and they started dating. Now here's where the pattern emerges. Mo told Cheryl he wanted a family, he wanted a wife and children. He was acting as though he's completely single and he didn't have those things yet. And after a few months of dating Cheryl, she called his house and a woman answered. She told Cheryl that she was his wife. So Cheryl, pretty bummed out at this point, not knowing that she had just been duped, she decides not to be in an intimate relationship with Mo anymore. And then he seemed to vanish. Well, there was a reason for that. On May 9th, 1992, Mo was arrested in connection to an attempted premeditated murder, a drive-by that happened outside of a nightclub in Seattle. He apparently got into a fight with some guys inside and allegedly shot out of the window, hitting an innocent woman named Vonette Young right in the pelvis. He initially stated that he wasn't the one holding the gun, but the trial happened in April of 1993, and his wife Tasha was pregnant at the time. She gave birth in October of that year. And there are varying accounts. Some say he took a plea deal and pleaded guilty to attempted murder. Others say the military court proved that it was him. Either way, he was sentenced to 10 years at the United States Disciplinary Barracks at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, starting January of 1994. I found his sister, Brizetta, her name is Breeze for short, her blog. And one of them is about Mo, about his military prison record. She said that he was a model prisoner. He stayed out of trouble and he promised he would never go back to prison again. 
He only served five and a half years of his 10-year sentence, and he was transferred from Kansas in April 1998 to facilities in Oklahoma City, Springfield, and Phoenix, and then finally released in June of 1999. So I had to know more. And I don't want to bore you with every little tiny detail, but I'm telling you, when you hear some of this other stuff that's coming up in this case, your jaw will be on the floor. There are just no words. While he was serving time, he divorces Tasha on September 4th, 1997. All the while, he's writing letters to Cheryl, remember her, the girl from the club? And he explains, you know, the gun accidentally went off. That's what he said happened. So she trusts him. He says he wants to turn his life around. He wants a family, all those same things. After getting out of prison, he was sent to a halfway house in San Diego, California for four months. But once that was over, he drove to British Columbia to start a new life with Cheryl. She worked at a bank at the time, so he was basically Mr. Mom. Cheryl already had a son from a previous relationship, and Mo treated him like his own child. While Cheryl was at work, he cooked, he cleaned, he picked her up from work, dropped her off, ran all their errands, and she said he wasn't afraid to work hard. Now, he wasn't from Canada, so apparently he couldn't legally get a job, but he did odd jobs like moving furniture for people. They finally took a road trip to Fargo, North Dakota, in November of 1999, a few months after he got out of prison. That's where his mom was living. He had not seen her in years. But Cheryl was really surprised by the way his mom treated him when they arrived. It was as though she was underwhelmed and she didn't care. So this is just a highlight of the way he was treated. Well, Mo lived with Cheryl over the next eight to nine months, and Cheryl had gotten pregnant with his child. When she was pregnant, she found out he was literally cheating on her with her best friend that lived five doors down the hall. And he begged Cheryl to please, please keep him. He, he wanted a family with her, not the other girl. He said he was so, so sorry. It would never happen again. Well, she didn't buy it. And she called him some really evil names, but he never became violent. He never even raised his voice. And soon, he wasn't able to live in Canada at all, no matter where he was living because he tried coming over the border and they found out he had a criminal record so they wouldn't let him across. At that point, he got a place in Bellingham, Washington, and Cheryl would meet him at a mall every so often so that he could hang out with his newborn baby girl. While living in Bellingham, he enrolled in Whatcom College and started playing college basketball in the fall of 2001 till the spring of 2002. And he was also studying medical assisting. Then he got into professional boxing. This man really was a jack of all trades and a master at maybe one, which was lying to women. He came into the Bellingham Athletic Club and he wanted to join the White Cobra boxing team. The coach at the time, James Ferguson, he had trained thousands of boxers and made them into champions. He was really impressed with Mo at first because of the way he was built. He was very muscular, athletic, he was a powerhouse. He could tell he had experience fighting, and Mo said, yep, I've been in prison and I've been in gangs. But Ferguson said that Mo had a gentle side to him. He could be a killer in the ring, though. He hit a guy so hard once, the man's ankles broke. But the issue was Mo didn't have work ethic at all. He wasn't committed. Sure, he could knock someone out, but he wouldn't train like an athlete. So the coach passed on the opportunity to have Mo on his team especially because he would kind of cry and whine if he lost a match. After Ferguson rejected Mo, he never saw him again. It's like he vanished. But while he was working out at this gym, he met a woman. Her name was Faye. She was an art student, and she said Mo was very nice. He was quiet. He was soft-spoken, and he acted like he was single. She had no idea. He had two children, and he was actually engaged to a woman in Bellingham named Melissa. Yep. He strikes again. They got married in February of 2002, and he started dating Faye when Melissa was pregnant with his child. Does this sound familiar? That's because it's a pattern. He meets a girl, usually a single mom, by the way. He has a thing for single moms. If they already have a kid, that's better for him because he can act like Mr. Mom. Oh, he's so helpful. He's taking my other kid in like his own. Hmm, don't be fooled. He meets a girl, he acts like a gentleman, he says he wants to settle down, get married, have a family right away. Then he gets the woman pregnant, he cheats, and the cycle starts again. He also targets college students or women who are college graduates with good jobs. This is the pattern. And by May of 2002, Melissa was having his third child. Meanwhile, he's going out on dates with Faye, except he wasn't very social. 
Or maybe he wasn't trying to be caught by his wife because they would spend time at the gym. They would just practice boxing or going to play basketball at a local park. And Faye said he was very secretive. She knew he didn't like his mom and he hated his dad. But other than that, Mo really didn't talk about his background. He did tell Faye that he wanted to get married and have kids right away. Well, Faye had enough after about four months because he would leave for whole weekends at a time. Of course, he had another family. He wouldn't tell her where he lived. And when he returned, he would have these really outlandish tales about how his car got stolen. That's why he was gone. And he was always supposedly in the process of moving somewhere else, which I thought was very interesting and telling. He moved around a lot. And I think I know why. Interesting that he was moving the week Mindy was killed. When Faye broke up with Mo, he tried to change her mind, but he was never violent. He never raised his voice. He just disappeared from the boxing club and her life. And after the breakup, something weird happened. A couple months later, it was right before Mo's 30th birthday in August of 2002, Faye saw his old beat up car just sitting in a grocery store parking lot. At first the car was parked there, but over time she realized he left it there on purpose. But guess what? Faye finds out she's pregnant with his child. She has no idea where this man went. She gives birth March 20th, 2003, a mere 10 days after another one of his girlfriends from the same area gave birth as well on March 10th. These two women were pregnant at the same time and they didn't know it. I would be mortified. They could have had the same doctor. And he's still married to Melissa, y'all. I'm telling you, I've never even heard a story like this before. Fall 2002 to spring 2003, he was still playing basketball, going to college, and working at Fast Cap Shipping Center. His basketball coach at the time said that he was definitely an older player on the team. He never had a car. He always had to get a ride. But he did maintain the 2.0 average he needed in order to play. He didn't know much about Mo, but he did know that he carried around a military ID and he was really popular on campus. But as soon as the season ended, bam, he disappeared. And he'd never had a player do that before, just leave and not tell anyone where they were going. Faye ended up finally going to that grocery store and telling the staff, listen, that car out there, it ain't going anywhere. He abandoned it. But she also did something else. She went so far as to befriend a girl from the college that he was attending, someone that used to hang out with him, someone that knew where he was living back then. She took Faye to where she had hung out with Mo. It was a one-room, dirty little hole-in-the-wall apartment on the border of Canada, 16 miles away. Faye found the landlord and asked what happened. They told her that Mo just vanished, leaving everything behind, clothing, shoes. Everything was like he was still living there, but he was gone. We know Mo was in Texas August of 2003 because he was boxing there on a professional level. He actually obtained a professional boxing license. According to the Texas Boxing Association, he was a professional licensed cruiserweight boxer weighing in at 197 pounds from August 2003 to August 2004. Again, studying medical assisting at Hallmark Institute of Technology. August 25th was his debut fight at the Civic Center in Humble, Texas. Mo put down his hometown as San Antonio, and his promoter at the time was this guy, Reginald McGowan. He knew Mo as a really nice guy. He would see him with his pretty brunette that he referred to as his wife, <laughs> but we know his real wife, Melissa, was back in Washington at the time. He went on to fight in five different states, Arizona, South Dakota, Rhode Island, Minnesota, and he lost every one of those fights. He was basically just trying to get a paycheck. That seemed to be all he cared about. Mo never met his son that he had with Faye. However, he did find out that she was pregnant and found out she had a baby. And every year on Mother's Day, he would call her or text her and say, Happy Mother's Day. And that was it. He moved to North Dakota in June of 2004, where he enrolled at Mayville State University in the spring, studying physical education, the same major as Mindy, but a different college. Faye said that he moved there because Mo's mom wanted all her kids nearby. Scott Berry was the Mayville State basketball coach, and he said that Mo was well-mannered, mature, and disciplined. He also said Mo would talk about being a professional boxer, but they did not believe him until one day they turned on ESPN, and there he was. So he does tell the truth about some things. So this brings us up to date to when the 22-year-old college student claimed that she was drugged by him at a nightclub and taken advantage of against her will. He was in North Dakota at this time. He was actually dating a woman 
from North Dakota State University, which is in Fargo, the same city where the attack took place. Mo divorces his wife, Melissa, in January of 2005 because he's dating his new love that he already proposed to. He met his current love while playing basketball. He fell in love with a woman who played basketball for North Dakota State University, and her last name was Gibbs. I told you there was an origin story to his name. Mo was still going by his legal name, Glenn Morgan. However, he had been called Mo for a very long time. It's from the M-O in his last name, Morgan. When he requested a name change, August 15, 2005, he took his then fiance's last name and the Mo from his given last name, and he created Mo Gibbs. Interesting that he wanted to change his name after that attack happened. Well, the relationship with the love of his life ended, but he still took her last name. By January of 2005, he was living in Fargo and working at the Wingate Inn. He was working as a housekeeper. And there's something to that. There's something very important to that. That gave him access to rooms. If you have the key to a room, you can go in and go out anytime you want. Connect the dots. At this time is when he met Chrissy Judd, who was a student at Valley City State University. Her dad, George, was the athletic director. At the time, she was just getting out of a relationship and realized she was pregnant, and she was about to graduate from college. Mo was there for her, even though it wasn't his baby. But he could only visit on the weekends because he had a job in Fargo. Chrissy had been working at the Wagon Wheel Inn in Valley City for a very long time, and she knew her manager, Christy, very well. So she tells her, hey, Mo needs a job. I want him to be able to move closer. So with Chrissy's help, he lands a job at this other hotel. After that, he was able to move in with Chrissy and out of Fargo. Convenient. There's that usual pattern. By January of 2006, he's coaching the third and fourth grade boys basketball team for Valley City Parks and Recreation. His manager, Christy's son, was on the team that he coached. She thought he was an awesome coach. The boys absolutely adored him, and they were devastated by his arrest. Here's where things get very interesting, because at this point, Mo wants to start working at the university. Maybe because his fiance's dad worked there, he thought he could do what he always done in the past and get a little help getting the job, a shoe in. He applies for the job as a night security guard on campus. It requires a background check. And the school believes when they're submitting someone for a background check, it's going to be a nationwide criminal background check, right? That's what you'd think, especially for a job where you're in a position of authority. But it turns out the sheriff's office, for whatever reason, only conducted a local background check on Mo. They only searched city records. And that's, that's pretty dumb. They could see if they actually looked that he just moved there. The point of a background check is to do just that, to check their background where they've been before. And that wasn't done. The school said they usually don't do a lot of background checks. They only request a small number of them for potential employees that would have broad access to buildings on campus. Mo gets hired at the school. This easily could have been where he first saw Mindy. Or maybe it was when she moved into his apartment building. Somehow, their path crossed. And it wouldn't have been that hard. This is a small town. Mindy had a big personality. And Mo would go to a number of events. His current fiance was an alumni and her dad was the athletic director. Mo was even involved in basketball, a sport that Mindy loved. And he resembled her idol, Michael Jordan, with his muscular athletic physique. They were bound to have at least had a good conversation at one point. It's definitely possible. But we've seen Mindy's exes and her current boyfriend, and they definitely don't have a similar look to Mo, and it goes both ways. I know you haven't seen all of Mo's exes, but they look similar to Chrissy, who looks very different from Mindy, so what happened? Well, there's more. I'm almost wrapping it all up for you with a big bow on top. Mo is working as a security guard at the university from February 24th to April 15th. He's always had a thing for college students, so maybe it was his way to get close to them. But now, for whatever reason, he decides to apply for a job at the county jail. They have refused to comment about their hiring procedures, but there's no statewide policy set in place for county jails. However, there's a signed authorization form from Mo that allowed them to conduct a background check in Washington, California, Texas, 
and North Dakota. When someone's finally hired at the jail, they get fingerprinted, and then those fingerprints are sent to the FBI. But the thing is, this whole process takes some time. And I don't know whether these fingerprints are ever put into CODIS or if the military courts are different. However, a criminal background was never done. Not even when he requested a name change because in North Dakota, they don't require a background check. A lot of states do. And if it would have been done, they probably wouldn't have granted the change. It's what truly threw off his background checks. They failed to look into his former name. However, it does show up when you run a check of his new name. It shows that it's been changed. However, the chief of police said he never would have thought a name change could hide a criminal record. Sounds like someone dropped the ball. From all the articles I read, everyone was blaming someone else. I think they just gave Mo too much credit. He seemed like a nice guy. I get it. But look at Ted Bundy. Looks aren't everything. Mo begins working at the jail on May 17, 2006. This is merely months before Mindy's murder. Still, everyone who knew him during this time says he was a wonderful dad to his stepdaughter Tiana, a good fiancé to Chrissy, and an awesome coach. All positives. Did he have them all fooled? He married Chrissy in the summer of 2006 on June 30th. She's an artist, a photographer, and at the time, things were going well for them. Unbeknownst to Chrissy, though, Mo had been cheating on her. He had gotten another woman pregnant at the same time. Again, a 29-year-old woman named Amy Olson. They must have been pretty serious behind Chrissy's back because in nine days after Mo is arrested, on September 20th, he proposes to Amy, but he's still married. The man doesn't care. He throws women away like trash. And children, for that matter. Out with the old, in with the new, the honeymoon stage. He likes the thrill of the chase. And once he's got him hooked, he throws them back in and looks for another fish in the sea. It's cruel. Oh, and Amy already had his baby months before this in July. A newborn baby girl named Navea. I can't with this guy. I, I don't even know if Chrissy was aware that this was going on. Because Chrissy doesn't get the marriage to Mo annulled until after she gives birth. The annulment doesn't even go into effect till April 30th, 2007, a year later. And it must have been a legal strategy, I think. I'm not sure. Or maybe it was to collect funds from him. But I definitely know that in order for her to testify especially because she was testifying against him, she had to annul the marriage. We'll get into that later. But the poor woman was still paying off their wedding rings and their photo album. It's so sad. She had close to 2000 in expenses. What a waste. A complete waste in so many ways. But I do know this. Amy Olsen couldn't wait to be Amy Gibbs. She was standing by her man no matter what. And I need that meme cued right here because there's more. This is your man. Yes. Look at the screen. That's mine. And, and, I, and, I'm and gonna that's, stick and that's, him. and that's what you're going to settle for. I'm going to stick beside him. After the arrest, a woman inmate from the Barnes County Jail speaks up. She says on the morning of September 13th, the day that Mindy was killed, she was awoken at 6 a.m. to correctional officer Mo Gibbs violating her with his hand while she was sleeping. And conveniently, the cameras weren't pointing in that direction or they weren't recording that day. But this is very telling. The prosecutor now believes there is a clear motive here for Mindy's murder, Mo's sexual frustration, because he wasn't able to finish what he started that morning. She began to cause a little bit of a scene, so he stopped. She wasn't the only one. Five more women were brave enough to come forward against the one-time authority figure. And they told their stories of what he had done to them usually while they slept on his overnight shifts. October 26, 2006, Mo pleads not guilty to the murder charges against him. And that same day, he was charged separately with six counts of gross sexual misconduct at different levels because the acts were all different. All very serious offenses. By November, he pleaded not guilty to the Fargo case involving the 22-year-old victim that his DNA was linked to. In the spring of that next year, 2007, changes are legally made to the criminal background check requirements of correctional officers and other professionals in North Dakota because of Mo's case. He has a court date in March, and guess who's there? Amy Olson with their infant daughter, making an appearance. She said she already considered the couple married in her mind, but they have to wait until after the trial to make it official because where Mo is being held, they don't allow inmates to marry while they're waiting for trial. This woman said, 
that the delay was frustrating, but that it feels more like a technicality because our hearts are married. She said it doesn't take paperwork to confirm someone's feelings for you. Meanwhile, jury selection is happening in this case. This man's being charged with felony murder, which he faces up to life in prison without parole. And she's talking about how she's already introducing herself as Amy Gibbs and legally changing her name. She even had Gibbs tattooed on the back of her neck and a ring with Moe's initials tattooed on her finger. She said, you don't just do that for somebody on a whim, ma'am. That's the last name of a university student that this man fell in love with when he was married to another woman. That isn't even his real legal last name. My God, I can't. I don't even know what to think right now. Mindy's mom, she desperately wanted Mo Gibbs to apologize for taking Mindy's life. So she wrote him a letter and she never expected to get anything back. But Mo responded. He denied murdering Mindy. He refused to take responsibility for his actions. Mo told Eunice in his letter that he worked his entire life to prove that he was a good person and wouldn't have killed Mindy. Mindy's mom was hoping that Mo would finally take responsibility for his actions and show some remorse. But instead, he chose to deny any wrongdoing. The denials only added to their pain and their anger. He was unwilling to accept the consequences of his actions. Mo's attorneys get a venue change because of how much publicity this case got in the small town of Valley City. So they move it to Minot, North Dakota, which is over three hours away. His exes were shocked by his arrest. Cheryl said, yeah, he was manipulative, but he was never violent. And Faye said she was really hoping that this case against Mo was a mistake because he's a really good person. He just had a very bad childhood. And it turned out this wasn't the first time that people came to Mo's defense. Remember 1993? Well, the U.S. Navy prosecutor argued in his sentencing recommendation that Mo was dangerous. He was a man who needed to be put away from society for a long time. But all of Mo's friends and family disagreed. They said he was set up and that he just wouldn't rat out a friend. There were 24 letters written asking the court to grant Mo clemency. His mom wrote that she understood that her son might not always make the right decisions. She did not condone what he might have done, but giving him 10 years would not be justice. The letters were all about how good he was and respectful and loving. Even his wife at the time, Tasha, wrote a letter saying he was a devoted husband if she only knew. A military judicial official denied the requests for clemency, and Mo served his time. So now what? Was this case all a big mistake? Mo's defense attorneys think so. He argued that the authorities rushed to judgment in Mindy's case because Mo's DNA was found in the Fargo case. He said that the amount of DNA collected at Mindy's scene was very insignificant, and there's doubts that exist about how it got there and how long it had been there. Was it, though? Because the prosecution said it was a significant amount, 41.2 nanograms, 75 of which, 30.8 nanograms, belong to Mo, meaning the major profile is Mo's and the other belonged to Mindy herself. Plus, there was evidence that DNA belonging to Mo's was found on Mindy's bloody shirt as well. Interestingly, here's what he was able to dig up as far as other evidence or the lack thereof. There were no usable fingerprints found on the knives, but DNA from two different males were found on those knives and inside a pair of gloves at the apartment, and they didn't match Mo. Hair samples were collected, even from Mindy's left hand, the same one where they found the tissue underneath her nails, and the hairs were never able to be linked to anyone. Not Mo's hairs either. No evidence was found in Mo's car or his apartment linking him to Mindy. A delivery man came forward and said he saw two men Running from the apartment building on the day of Mindy's murder, authorities said they looked, but they could never find them. Mo had his one-year-old stepdaughter with him that day when Chrissy was at work. So the defense attorney questioned the logistics of this. He would have to have taken the child to the crime scene. That's what he said. Crime scene analysts said there were no signs that a baby was at the crime scene. So is that reasonable doubt? The defense also stated that the crime scene looked similar to ones that a woman perpetrator would stage, and it didn't look like the aftermath of someone the size of Mo. What he meant was there would actually have been more damage if someone his size would have done this. He went on to say that Mo's DNA was found because of transferred DNA from the communal areas of the apartment building, like the door handle from the door they all shared. 
But like I said, there was also DNA found on Mindy's bloody shirt, and Moe's DNA could not be excluded. Here's what could have been confusing and caused doubts. The crime scene analyst, Hope Olson, same name as Moe's uh, new fiance, but no relation, she did agree that the small amount of Moe's DNA could be touch DNA, but it was extremely unlikely. But she said it could not be secondary transfer, meaning it couldn't come from a door, but instead it had to come from somebody in contact with Mindy. The trial began on June 19, 2007. The prosecution brought forth all the evidence that I've already mentioned, plus more. They added that Mo was an avid texter. He was texting and emailing all day constantly in his phone, even when he was at work. When they pulled up his records, there was never a period of time where he went over an hour or hours without texting, calling, emailing, or doing something on his phone. They pulled up text messages, social media, Yahoo, MSN Messenger. He was unaccounted for for at least an hour and five minutes that day. On the day of Mindy's murder, after dropping Chrissy off at work, she texted him at 12.33. It's this text on the screen right now. It says, can you bring me a drink? Powerade, water or apple juice or Snapple strawberry kiwi? At 12.45, he says he dropped off a drink and by 12.47, he left her work. But that's when they also believe Mindy was killed. Her first unanswered call was at 12.47. And after that last text from Chrissy, every other text went unanswered on Mo's phone until approximately 1.30. And at that moment, a rush of them were answered and activity went back to normal again. Also, recall the smell of pine salt beginning around 1 o'clock, according to witnesses. The prosecution's theory is that Mo saw his opportunity. He pushed Mindy inside her apartment and attempted to force himself on her, but she was athletic, stronger than he thought, and she fought hard. And when she fought back, things went from bad to worse, and he realized he had to take drastic steps. He tried to strangle her with a belt, but just to make sure she was dead, he grabbed a knife from her kitchen. The first knife actually breaks, so he grabs the second and tried to actually use it to cut her throat. That's a very hard thing to accomplish. He gave up pretty quickly and instead just stabbed her, then took pine saw and poured it all over her body, hoping to get rid of some evidence. And then he fled back to his apartment. His texting and emailing started right up again. Mindy's never did. Considering he lived inside the apartment building, no one would have seen anyone running in or out. The prosecutor held up Mindy's bloody shirt and it was way worse than I thought. It all made sense to me. This man was guilty, but the jury didn't get to hear everything. They didn't get to hear about the motive. Nope. They didn't get to hear about his past. Not at all. They were limited to what was at the crime scene and what witnesses said. And you know how many people had good things to say about Mo. His past, about the shooting, the conduct at the jail, even what he did in Fargo. None of that got in. The prosecution tried to get it in. At least maybe just what occurred on the morning of Mindy's murder at the jail, but that was denied too. Too prejudicial, the court said. The defense had argued to the judge that there were no signs of anything sexual at Mindy's crime scene. Ultimately, the jury wasn't convinced. The evidence pointed both ways, that he could or that he could not have done it. There was reasonable doubt, and they were deadlocked after four days. 6-6, six, six, a hung jury. Mindy's family and friends were shocked, and Chrissy was terrified. She did not know if this man was going to walk the streets again, but that's not how it works. They were going to set up a brand new trial, but everything had to be redone. Former jurors actually came forward and gave prosecutors advice on what they could have done better. I didn't even know that was allowed, but one of them said they didn't put enough emphasis on the DNA under the fingernails. They needed to prove it wasn't transfer. And two, there was a problem. At the first trial, they showed a 90-minute redacted version of Moe's interrogation before his arrest, and he had baby Tiana in his arms. It pulled at the jurors' heartstrings, and I get it, we're human. The jurors said they saw how much that little girl needed him and loved him. They didn't know one bad thing about Moe because, remember, they couldn't know anything about his past, so they saw him as a good person, as a good dad. The DA knew they needed an expert that could refute the transfer DNA theory, and they need to exclude that video of Tiana and Mo. Once again, they tried to get the judge to let in one sexual incident at the jail on the 13th, but it was again denied. Mo's second trial began October 2007, a few months following the first one, and it was moved to Grand Forks, North Dakota, two hours away. This time, the prosecutor had more witnesses, more experts, especially to explain the amount of the DNA being significant and not being able to be transferred from a door 
or him helping her take her laundry basket up to her apartment. The new expert said this amount of DNA could only have gotten there from vigorous physical contact, like scratching the arm in defense of someone trying to grab you. Mo actually wanted to hire Michael Bodden, a forensic expert, but he couldn't afford him. He's a famous doctor whose wife has her own show, Linda Kinney Bodden, the defense attorney. And Bodden usually does testify as a witness for the defense cases. So they thought they got the next best thing, a former actor that used to play a forensic scientist, but then went on to own his own lab. I guess that's all they could afford. But again, the jury was deliberating for days. Finally, they came back. This time, it was guilty. Finally. I mean, to me, it was clear from everything I saw. But I could see how there could be reasonable doubt. It's hard. Sometimes I think it's not fair that they can't know how bad these people are, like what they've done before. Eunice actually forgave Mo, saying, Mr. Gibbs, I forgive you publicly here. I also want you to know, I won't forget what you did to Mindy. But this man remained arrogant. He denied it literally addressing the courtroom saying, I didn't commit this crime. If and when the person who actually did this crime came to justice, I would forgive him just as she would have forgiven me. Really, you would have forgiven him? He was sentenced to life without parole. Had Mo had stayed in prison and served his full sentence for the attempted murder when he was in the Navy, the full sentence would have not ended until April 6, 2003, possibly not giving him enough time to cross paths with Mindy at all. He did end up pleading guilty to the sexual misconduct at the county jail and to the one in Fargo. And the victim gave an impact statement at his sentencing hearing. And she said she was not very nice to him. She said he has daughters of his own. She wanted to say a lot of things and she did. She said, imagine your daughters screaming how I did on the night in 2004. Her message that she wanted to give was that there is a life and happiness after all of this. She's married now with children of her own, and she says that she's going to tell them her story and Mindy's when they're old enough. She wants to warn them. In the end, Mindy fighting back that day helped solve her own murder and the other crimes Mo committed against all of those other women. Her family said that's the way she would have wanted it. She always cared about helping others and would have made sacrifices so that others could live. That's exactly why she was living in that apartment building to begin with to take the pain of those chemo infusions and hope that her sacrifice would help others survive multiple sclerosis. I know this was a long video. You like long videos. I know there was a lot of details in this video. I thank you so very much for listening to Mindy's story. It was such a senseless death. I thank you all so very much for being here, and I will see you in my next video. Bye.